If you grew up playing console role-playing games like I did, chances are that you not only knew about Squaresoft, you probably poured hours into their most legendary titles. And even before the company merged with Enix to form the RPG mega giant Square Enix, it completely dominated the SNES landscape. Above all, Squaresoft meant quality. So when you went to the store and forked over your hard-earned money on one of their games, you could be absolutely certain it would be awesome. Squaresoft's titles were packed with great characters, story, music, and gameplay, and I just couldn't get enough of them back then. Secret of Mana, Final Fantasy VI, Chrono Trigger, and Super Mario RPG are just a few examples, and the list goes on and on. It was truly a golden age both for Squaresoft and RPGs in general. In this video, I'm going to cover each of Squaresoft's games on the platform in chronological order and explain what made them so great, including the ones that only came out in Japan on the Super Famicom. This video includes games the company created as well as the ones it published. But before I get into all that, please like this video and subscribe to the channel for more retro gaming and classic RPG content. Now, sit back and let's dive right into Squaresoft on the SNES, the Golden Age. In 1991, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System was in its very infancy. Squaresoft had already released three Final Fantasy titles on the original Famicom, and the series was a smash hit. The first of the three took the Nintendo by storm in North America as well toward the end of its life. By this point, Final Fantasy was a huge, known commodity in the gaming world. With fans aching for more, Squaresoft eagerly adapted the series to a new era of gaming for the Super Nintendo, and thus Final Fantasy IV was born. This brought a whole new group of fans to the role-playing genre for the first time. It also set the course for the next generation of the Final Fantasy series, and captivated millions of gamers. As was usual by that time, series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi once again took the helm as director, determined to produce the best Final Fantasy game yet. Originally, the game was planned to be released on the Famicom, but delays in scheduling forced Square to bring it to the Super NES. The development team consisted of 14 individuals and the game took about a year to complete. Among the design team was Hiroyuki Ito, who made his mark upon the game by developing the Active Time Battle System, or ATB. Under the new framework for combat, characters and enemies each had their own speed and associated meter that would determine the order of combat turns. This new apparatus would become a mainstay of role-playing games for years to come. In fact, it's almost impossible to overstate how influential this system was, and RPGs continue to use some form of ATB decades after it was originally created for this game by Ito. Not only did the ATB system cause players to have to plan better to formulate attacks based upon which characters go in which order, it also created better, interactive gameplay where the player always had to pay attention to what was going on. It can certainly be said that the ATB system did much to diminish combat monotony and keep the player's focus over the course of the game. The advent of the ATB system truly revolutionized role-playing games as we know them. There's just no other way to say it than that. Another big addition to the series after the platform change to the Super NES was new graphical technology, including Mode 7 a new system that allows visual background layers to be rotated and scaled quickly, creating a 3D-like effect. It may not seem too impressive of a feat now, but back then this was a huge advance in video gaming. Final Fantasy IV aptly uses Mode 7 to render the world map when traveling in an airship. Confusing some gamers is the fact that Final Fantasy IV came to North America as Final Fantasy II because North America didn't see the second and third title in the series. Right after starting the game, you launch directly into the game's story. This was yet another relatively new facet for Final Fantasy, because in the previous games, you don't get very much background story at all in the beginning. You begin the game as Cecil, the Dark Lord Captain of the Red Wings. The Red Wings are ordered by the King of Baron to attack the city of Mesidia, seize the Water Crystal, and bring it back to the kingdom. Cecil reluctantly carries out the orders, returning to Baron with the crystal after seizing it from those that guard it. There, he sees his love interest, Rosa, who is a white mage. 
After bringing the crystal back, Cecil questions the king's motives and is stripped of his position as captain of the Red Wings. He is then sent with Kane, the captain of Baron's Dragoons, to deliver a ring to the village of Mist. At this point, the game's story truly begins and you even receive a cool little storyline summary that frames the journey. Along the way, Cecil and Kane's paths diverge, but they eventually intertwine several times. Among the themes visited in the storyline are death, loyalty, friendship, and betrayal. As far as the story goes, I think it is generally very strong, especially for its time. The new Super Nintendo platform was a complete blessing for Final Fantasy. This was because it allowed for bigger storage, and thus the ability to hold much more dialogue and storyline segments. This is really what the first three Final Fantasies needed, but couldn't deliver on the NES platform. Game designer Takashi Takita, who produced the original game, said the following on the subject in 2008. It seems commonplace to have such epic storylines in RPGs now, but this was the first RPG to feature such deep characters and plot, so I'm truly happy. Indeed, one need only play one of the original NES Final Fantasy games, and then Final Fantasy IV, to see the stark contrast between storyline details. Final Fantasy IV was truly a big step forward in this regard, and a total advancement for the series. The main villain in the game is Golbez, a mysterious sorcerer who's trying to obtain all of the world's crystals to bring himself to the moon. Golbez is manipulative and cunning, and does much to cement his place in the series as the first complex antagonist in a Final Fantasy game. He really was the first Final Fantasy adversary with true character complexity. I think he is used very effectively in the story, and he brings a lot of intrigue to the game. At one point in the game, Cecil transforms from a Dark Knight into a Paladin, leaving behind his former Dark Persona in favor of a nobler one. This was not the first time class evolution has been done in the series, but it is the first case in which it played a pivotal role in the storyline. As a wee young gamer, I remember how excited I was when Cecil's look and abilities had changed. I was even elated to see a different sword slice animation. There's just something cool and unique about the whole transition. Through these circumstances, the game explores the individual identity of the characters and their progression as people, something that had never really been done before in a role-playing game, let alone the series. I have to admit though, the end of the story in Final Fantasy IV gets a bit confusing and arbitrary. All of a sudden you're in a fantasy world doing things like slaying dragons and recruiting friends, then you're confronting a colossal robot? Then you're sent to the moon and fly around on a giant whale? Huh? Also, the end boss of the game basically appears out of nowhere at the very end of the game. This was a unique twist, but there was little backstory on the creature to make it truly compelling. I didn't care about this much as a young player, but in hindsight, I feel it could have been handled a little bit better in the story. Even so, the storyline curveballs this game throws out at the player were surprising and interesting, unlike anything that had been done before in a Final Fantasy title. As far as difficulty goes, the North American version of the original game is quite a bit easier than some of the other games in the series. In fact, this decision was intentional, as the North American version was based off of the Japanese Final Fantasy IV Easy Type, a simpler version of the game. Other changes were also made to the game to conform to Nintendo's strict standards for content, which includes removing all references to praying, and the spell Holy was even renamed to White. There is even one place in the game where a giant scythe that is about to fall onto Rosa is changed into a giant ball. As if the prospect of having one's head crushed is so much more palatable than being sliced. In accordance with these changes, some abilities were even taken out of the game. This included Rosa's Prey and Cecil's Dark Wave. These changes were unfortunate, especially the removal of the original abilities and the radical adjustment to the game's difficulty. However, I suppose the latter attracted more fans to the franchise than would have been gained otherwise. The game's music is another place where Final Fantasy IV excels. The soundtrack in the game was undoubtedly a huge step forward for the franchise. With the technical limitations of the original Nintendo now a thing of the past, famous Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Uematsu was able to push the boundaries of video game music with this game. Uematsu has publicly stated that creation of the soundtrack was an excruciating process. 
Accordingly, it involved long hours of work into the night at Squaresoft headquarters, where Uematsu would sometimes even stay overnight. I'd say that's dedication. In his liner notes for the Final Fantasy IV original soundtrack, Uematsu wrote the following, quote, Since I was working with new hardware in the Super Famicom, the music was from start to finish a series of trials and errors, and the staff practically lived at the company, staying over in sleeping bags and doing nothing but working. I myself haven't had a full day off since February of last year. Appropriately, Uematsu signed the liner notes April 13th, 1991, at 1.30 a.m., in the office, naturally. With 44 total tracks in the game, Uematsu's use of the platform shined above all other RPGs to be released by that point. When this soundtrack was released, it seemed as if the skies were the limit for Uematsu and the possibilities for music in the future of the series. There are just so many standout tracks on this game, but among my favorites are the theme of love, the overworld theme, the red wings, and the main theme for Final Fantasy IV. The game was eventually re-released on the PlayStation, the Game Boy Advance, the PlayStation Portable, and the Nintendo DS. There's also a version on Steam so you can play the game on a PC. Each version of the game is quite different, but if you're looking for a recommendation for a version to play for the first time, I recommend the Game Boy Advance or PSP version. Between these two, I lean toward the PSP one because the graphics look beautiful, the sprites are awesome, and the translation is quite a bit superior to the original. The load times on the PlayStation version are quite annoying to deal with, and the Nintendo DS and Steam versions use a brand new graphics engine and 3D style that I do not like very much, but I will say many people do enjoy that version. It's not particularly bad, it's just a little bit too cartoony for my tastes. When Final Fantasy IV was first released, it was a commercial success, both in Japan and elsewhere. In Japan, 1.44 million copies of the game were sold, making it a huge hit for the era. By 2007, the game in all its forms had shipped about 3 million copies worldwide. At the time of its release, the game was met with lots of critical acclaim from gaming publications. Nintendo Power declared that it set a new standard of excellence for role-playing games. GamePro announced that it truly redefines the standards for fantasy adventure games. Electronic Gaming Monthly stated that Square has just redefined what the ultimate RPG should be. The game took a bit longer to catch on in North America, but its success was undoubtedly amplified by the release of Final Fantasy VI, which revolutionized the series yet again and brought many new fans to the older Final Fantasy games, including IV. Since then, the game has been included in many top video game of all time lists, and it's easy after playing this game to see why. Let's face it, chances are high that everyone watching this video is a fan of the Final Fantasy series, or at least knows a lot about it. Of course, it's Square Enix's flagship RPG series. What you may not be aware of though, is that in the 1990s, Square was cultivating a rival RPG series, the Saga franchise, and dedicated just as much energy to it. In fact, when Final Fantasy IV was in development, both series had an equal number of games. When it came time to release Romancing Saga for the Super Famicom in 1992, it's safe to say that many RPG fans anticipated it in the same way they anticipated Final Fantasy IV. Now it is true that Romancing Saga was eventually remade as Romancing Saga Minstrel Song for the PlayStation 2. In 2022, that version was also remastered and re-released for Android, iOS, Steam, Switch, PlayStation 4, and PlayStation 5, but we'll get to that part later, because my first experience with the game was with the original SNES version, or more accurately, the Super Famicom version, because this game was never originally localized in North America. If you want to play that version, you can still pick up a fully translated English patch at the link in the description and play this one in its original form. Regardless of which version you play, the story and basic mechanics are similar, even if the visual presentation in the remake is quite a bit different. Romancing Saga utilizes several mechanics that made it stand out from other RPGs. First, when you fire up the game, you select from one of eight protagonists, each of which has a different story and special abilities. Once you make this choice, it's locked in for the entire game 
but it really doesn't change the main story narrative too much outside of a unique, character-specific opening scenario. In fact, this and the other romancing saga games feature a very non-linear approach, and you aren't locked into a set chain of events as in other RPGs. There is an overarching narrative, but you're given a lot of freedom to explore, complete various quests, and trigger storyline events in an order of your own choosing. The game's creators called this the Free Scenario System, and it's influenced all other Saga games since. Another unique facet to the romancing Saga games is that there aren't random encounters. Instead, enemies appear on the screen that you can walk past and evade. Generally, the enemies move toward you and try to attack you as you walk by though, so it's difficult to avoid them all. Like the other Saga games, Romancing Saga doesn't even have actual levels either. Instead, you have a random chance to gain stat increases after battles in which you performed an action tied to that stat. For example, if you use a sword against an enemy in battle, you have a chance to gain a hit point raise. Using martial arts makes it possible to gain agility increases, and using spells gives you a chance to have your BP raised. And speaking of BP, that's a stat similar to magic points in other RPGs. Each skill takes a specific amount of BP to use. Unlike other RPGs, each character's hit points are fully replenished after every battle, which makes healing in between battles a non-factor. Characters can equip several weapons, and each equipped weapon opens a new subset of up to four skills that can be used in battle once the weapon is fully leveled up. It does take some time grinding to gain access to all of each weapon's skills, which incentivizes long-term use of powerful ones. Also, you can use up to six characters in a party at a time, and characters are placed in formations with three columns of rows. Characters in the front row take and deal the most damage, characters in the back row take less damage and deal less damage, and attacks and defense of the middle row characters are averaged out. In other words, it's a lot like the Final Fantasy games, just with a middle row added. The only problem with this is that unless you engage the enemy in battle head on, your formation will be disrupted, and you may have to spend turns changing rows to avoid taking too much damage or hampering your ability to deal damage. The last thing in this long list of characteristics unique to romancing Saga games is the character recruitment style. There isn't a set order to recruit characters, so you're free to basically explore the world, trigger storyline sequences, and find who you can. There were parts of the game where you can get stuck with a few characters for long lengths of time until you find others, but I did notice that some of the characters can be obtained from pubs. In all honesty, Romancing Saga can be a frustrating and difficult game if you can't recruit enough characters fast enough, and it's easy to be outnumbered by enemies in the beginning part of the game. But I guess that's the allure of the game's free-roaming open-ended style also. As far as the story goes, Romancing Saga takes place in the world of Mardius. A war long ago raged between three wicked gods, Death, Saruin, and Shirach on one side, and the Lord of All Gods Elor on the other. At the end of the conflict, Death and Shirach were stripped of their powers, and Saruin was imprisoned through the power of the Ten Fate Stones, which were given to a legendary hero named Mursa for safekeeping. After the passage of a thousand years though, the Fate Stones were lost and scattered throughout the world, causing the forces of evil to awaken from their slumber and set out to free Saruin. Eight heroes then emerged to counterbalance the Dark Forces, which happened to be the protagonists you can select from. Each has wildly different backgrounds and personalities, but all of them have the potential to, you guessed it, save the world. The soundtrack for Romancing Saga was created by Kenji Ito, who worked on the second Saga title on the Game Boy as well. I especially enjoy the main theme, which became a staple for the series and was incorporated into Romancing Saga 2 and 3 as well. You'll find a great assortment of fantasy tunes here that aren't too unlike the quality of the work of Nobuo Uematsu. Because the two work together at times, it's also quite possible they influenced each other's style. Each of the eight protagonists have their own theme, which are honestly really good, and there's a lot of other great tracks too. In my mind, this soundtrack deserves five stars, it's really good. As I mentioned earlier, Romancing Saga was remade and repackaged into Romancing Saga Minstrel Song for the PlayStation 2, then remastered and re-released in 2022 for many modern platforms. 
This version retains the story and most of the mechanics exactly, but the graphical presentation uses an exaggerated, cartoony style that gives the characters big heads. It also uses a combat system that looks much more like the newer Saga games. Now don't get me wrong here, I'm glad Square Enix finally found a way to modernize the game so a North American audience could play it in an official capacity for the first time. But as you guys know, I'm old school, so I like the original graphical style more. I just have to admit, the cartoony look seemed to me to cheapen the serious fantasy motif the game was going for. I think Square Enix did a way better job preserving the original feel with the Romancing Saga 2 remaster than with this one, but they were clearly going for a different approach there. Overall, Romancing Saga is a good early Super Famicom era RPG that a lot of people missed out on. It used many unique concepts creatively, especially for the time, and gave the player a sense of exploration not found in many other titles like this. The difficulty level is a little too high and there's way too many swarms of enemies at times. I mean, just look at this. Ah, And this. No! Just realize that the lack of random encounters certainly doesn't mean less encounters. But hey, if you can get over those things, there's a lot to love here about Romancing Saga. I think most fans of retro RPGs will really like it if they haven't tried it. Just don't expect a pure Final Fantasy clone. Released in 1992 for the Super Famicom, Final Fantasy V is a unique offering in the series. Praised for its intense emphasis on story and character customization, the game has won fans from across the globe. Final Fantasy V was the only game in the series for the Super Famicom that didn't come to North America. As such, the game also has the distinction as receiving one of the first ever fan translations, which brought a whole new audience to the game. According to GamePro Magazine, the game was so highly anticipated that the Japanese government asked Squaresoft not to release it during the weekend so as not to interfere with the focus of school children. For the last time in the history of the series, Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi directed the game and created its story. Yoshinori Kitase also assisted Sakaguchi in this role by conceiving humorous elements to inject into the plot. Hiroyuki Ito developed the memorable class system in the game. Yoshitako Amano designed the characters, and Tetsuya Nomura designed the enemies. As usual, series legend Nobuo Uematsu created the game's soundtrack. Sakaguchi was especially proud of Final Fantasy V, calling it his favorite Final Fantasy game in the series prior to Final Fantasy IX. Development on the English translation of the game began shortly after its release in Japan, and Squaresoft fully intended the game to be released in North America. However, due to the game's difficulty and unique tone in the series, the company considered releasing the game in North America as a standalone one, rather than part of the Final Fantasy series. The North American version was eventually cancelled, but even after that was announced, rumors alleged that Squaresoft would still localize the game as Final Fantasy Extreme. However, this never came to fruition. The decision not to bring the game to North America saddened many fans of the series we were forced to wait several years instead for Final Fantasy VI. The game was finally released in North America in 2001 as part of Final Fantasy Anthology, and again in 2006 for the Game Boy Advance. The story begins as the King of Tycoon Castle decides to head to the Wind Shrine after he notices the wind has stopped. But a young traveler stumbles upon a meteorite near the castle. He rescues Lena, the Princess of Tycoon there, who has fallen. Nearby, they discover Galif, an old man suffering from amnesia. After finding an underground cavern, the three meet Ferris, the leader of a den of pirates, who decides to join up with them all as well. The four adventurers make their way to the Wind Shrine, finding that the crystal there has shattered. An image of the king appears and makes a plea to Butts and his companions to protect the remaining crystals. The team eventually learns that the intact crystals formed a seal to contain the power of X-Death, an evil ancient sorcerer who had been defeated by the Warriors of Dawn 30 years prior to when the game begins. If the crystals are broken, X-Death will be revived and his power will be unleashed upon the world. When compared to the other Final Fantasy villains like Kefka and Sephiroth, X-Death certainly doesn't offer as much character depth, but his power does lend itself to the game's more simplistic feel. 
and X-Death is actually something of a microcosm for the entire story, which is more crude and straightforward than some of its counterparts. Most of the story's elements differed from its predecessor, Final Fantasy IV, but the story had roughly the same amount of complexity as that one. There aren't as many long, engrossing storyline segments that take time to flesh out in Final Fantasy V. There are some interesting moments that explain the game's events, but the game seems to drive the player toward gameplay more than story. The most defining aspect of Final Fantasy V is definitely the class system. It's the feature of the game that sets it apart from all the others in the series. Expanding upon an idea utilized in Final Fantasy III, the player can customize each character's class from a list, each with different abilities and benefits. Each class has an inherent default ability that comes when the new class is equipped. For instance, ninjas can throw weapons at enemies to do damage. Blue mages can cast special magic learned from enemy attacks. Black mages can cast powerful offensive magic against enemies. The player acquires new classes from crystal shards found throughout the story, and there are 21 total classes in the original game, including the default one. The player gains class levels as they accumulate ABP throughout the game, and each class level unlocks a new ability. Abilities gained in this way can be equipped onto the character, even if the character becomes a different class. Character classes are fully customizable, and unlike Final Fantasy III, there's virtually no penalty for changing classes on the fly. Unlike many of the previous games in the series, this gives the player almost full control over the specifics of his own party, and much of the fun in the game comes from creating the best team of classes to take up each of the game's challenges. However, it does seem to me that the power level of the classes varies dramatically. For instance, I found the Summoner, Mystic Knight, and Ninja to offer incredible abilities that help throughout the game. However, the Beastmaster and Dancer both seem to be much less powerful overall. Even still, each circumstance in the game differs and some classes that aren't very good overall can still find their niche in specific situations. Nobuo Uematsu crafted his biggest collection of songs to date for Final Fantasy V. After originally predicting that the game would take more than 100 songs, he narrowed the score down to 56 tracks. Dear Friends has become a fan favorite, and it has even been performed by a full symphony orchestra. Clash on the Big Bridge, the song during the fight with Gilgamesh, has also become a hit with the fans, and was even remixed and placed into Final Fantasy XII. Although I can't say that the soundtrack was quite as good as Final Fantasy VI, it was still a step forward for the franchise. For fans that want games with challenging difficulty, Final Fantasy V is certainly a breath of fresh air. Quite a bit more difficult than the other entries in the series, some of the bosses are difficult to overcome without sufficient job or skill preparation. In fact, the game's difficulty level was cited as one of the main reasons Squaresoft balked at the prospect of bringing it to North America. Ted Woolsey, who began work on translating the game, said the following about this in a 1994 interview. As for Final Fantasy V though, well, although we're sure it's a great title, it hasn't been a hit with too many people in our out-focus groups. Although the more experienced gamers love the complex character building. It's just not accessible enough to the average gamer. Indeed, after beating this game a few times, I can confirm that it is one of the most difficult entries in the Final Fantasy series. For those that are looking for a decent challenge on their first playthrough though, this is definitely the Final Fantasy game to play. One breakthrough Final Fantasy V brought to the series was the usage of sprite reactions, where the characters respond emotionally to certain events or dialogue. Prior to Final Fantasy V, the Final Fantasy games had relied only upon dialogue to tell the story or communicate information. This changed in Final Fantasy V, and allowed the audience to grasp the storyline in a more comprehensive way through the sprite animations. Future games in the series, such as Final Fantasy VI, built upon this idea by including even more sprite animations. What Final Fantasy V lacks in character development and storyline, it definitely makes up in gameplay, music, and overall fun. The class system is probably the best framework of customization in the entire series and provides a lot of possible replay value by allowing the player to master all classes for all the characters. For these reasons, it's simply one of the best Super Famicom role-playing games ever released, and certainly beats out a lot of the other games on the system. I can't say that the game is better than Final Fantasy VI, but I do think it edges out Final Fantasy IV overall. 
While not the best game in the series, I can conclusively say that it was a crime not to publish this game in North America until so many years later. If you are into role-playing games in the Final Fantasy series, it is an absolute must-play. The 1990s was a time when strategy RPGs dominated the console landscape. However, real-time strategy games that were super popular on the PC at the time, like Total Annihilation, Warcraft 2, and Command and & Conquer, were almost nowhere to be found in the console universe. One exception to this was Hanjuku Hero, A Sekaiyu Hanjuku Nare, or Hanjuku Hero Let the World Become Soft Boiled. It was a Squaresoft game released on the Super Famicom in Japan in 1992. Hanjuku Hero Let the World Become Soft Boiled was actually the second game in the Hanjuku Hero series, a franchise that now has five games. It came out on December 19, 1992, which was only two weeks after Final Fantasy V was released. And this fact is honestly pretty telling, because it was totally overshadowed by Squaresoft's flagship title. The most unfortunate thing about this game, at least according to this guy, Gene, is that it lacks a full English translation. All the translated versions, such as the one in the footage playing now, is part of an incomplete package that localizes only the bare minimum text and leaves everything else untranslated. I'll leave a link to the one I'm using in the description below, but as I said, it's pretty rough and it doesn't exactly help that much. The basic premise of Hanjuku Hero Let the World Become Soft Boiled involves controlling units on a map in real time. Your goal is to use your Shogun, the top commander, to capture fortresses and complete objectives. The overworld gameplay actually functions a lot like the Ogre Battle games, but when you clash with units you transition into a turn-based encounter. And let's just say, uh, they're pretty darn silly. I mean, look at this, it's insane. Your units and the opponent's units basically launch their bodies at each other over and over and bounce off each other like they're running into a balloon or something. After you complete enough objectives, there are also boss encounters where you do get to provide individual menu commands, and these are the most intense. There are also cards you can use in this game to give you an advantage in battle, so you may think this title ripped off Ogre Battle. But actually, this came out four months before Ogre Battle. You can carry up to three cards at a time, and you can obtain them in castles, along with soldiers for the army. In addition, you can also acquire eggs that hatch into powerful summon monsters that allow you to defeat the bosses, and this is pretty cool too. I also like the fact that there is a timing system, so the seasons change over time and you're able to upgrade your castles and hire new generals at the end of each month. Santa even appears and gives you presents on Christmas, and you get bonus money on New Year's Day. I like these touches and the fact that you can make adjustments every so often made it feel pretty involved. It kind of reminded me of Sim City. Probably the most interesting thing about this game is that the soundtrack was composed by legendary Dragon Quest composer Koichi Sugiyama, and I think it was the only Squaresoft game he ever created music for. His style is immediately recognizable too, and it's a big bright spot. So anyway, Hanjuku Hero Let the World Become Soft Boiled is a really silly game on the surface, and the English translation is rough and unfinished. In fact, even if you play with the incomplete translation patch, you probably won't understand what the heck's going on most of the time. But if you can get over those two things, there's some truly fun gameplay to be had, and you won't find much like it on the console outside of Ogre Battle. Let's just hope this one makes Square Enix's list of games to remaster and bring to us an English form in the future. But for now, there's plenty of other SNES RPGs that do have translation patches that you should definitely prioritize over this one. By the summer of 1993, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System already epitomized the 16-bit era. Its stature in the gaming industry produced several noteworthy RPGs. Final Fantasy IV, though not a smash hit in North America, was critically acclaimed, and games like Lufia and the Fortress of Doom and Breath of Fire made a great impression on enthusiasts as well. When Secret of Mana was released in 1993, it offered an experience that no other RPG to that point provided. Rather than a turn-based, strategic-oriented battle system, Secret of Mana emphasized action-oriented gameplay and adventure, 
while incorporating RPG elements. Some fans may be surprised to realize that Secret of Mana was actually the second game in the Seiken Densetsu franchise, the first being localized as Final Fantasy Adventure for the Game Boy. Believe it or not, its follow-up Secret of Mana was originally planned to be released on the Super NES CD-ROM, the product of a joint venture between Nintendo and Sony. The CD format, which was considered revolutionary at the time, would have allowed many more times the amount of data to be stored on the disc, allowing for more text and a larger world. However, the CD-ROM project never fully came to fruition, and Sony's progress on what they had built was eventually used as the foundation for the Sony PlayStation. This change was a setback to the developers, who were then forced to adapt the game they had been working on into cartridge format. According to one account, the designers initially resisted continuing the project rather than making the cuts needed due to the change in format. However, they were eventually overruled by Square Management, and work on Secret of Mana continued. Despite the development challenges, RPG fans can be glad that the finished product ended up being considered among the best games on the system. One of the reasons the game gets such reverence today was its unique combat system. For battle, Secret of Mana makes use of a recharging system of sorts, where each character has a gauge that determines the amount of damage that would be done to an enemy when attacking. After each strike, the gauge requires a short time to charge back up to 100%, and if you attack enemies prior to this point, the damage dealt is considerably less. Additionally, you can hold the attack button to save energy for a charged attack. Depending on your character's aptitude with their weapon, the attack can be stored in multiple increments. While charging, your character moves much slower, but when the attack is unleashed, it deals extra damage. In general, Secret of Mana's battle system prevented players from just wrecking everything by spamming the button quickly, and encouraged planning attacks in advance. The weapon progression system is another part of Secret of Mana that should be highlighted. There are eight total weapons, the sword, spear, bow, axe, boomerang, glove, javelin, and whip. After obtaining the weapons, they each grow progressively stronger after being used in combat, and each has eight total levels of strength. What's more is that the weapons themselves can be upgraded after finding weapon orbs, rare items found throughout the game. When taken to a blacksmith, the orb is expended to reforge a weapon and give it greater power. This system, more than anything else in the game, was a fun way to incentivize random battles, Giving players a way to evolve in power beyond what the leveling system offered was an innovation that definitely kept me playing, and worked very well to make the gameplay fun. Secret of Mana uses an inventory system that was novel for the time based on circular menus. Whenever the menu button is selected, the action pauses completely, allowing the player to select items or use spells. When the item or spell is selected, the action is taken while gameplay proceeds. Unfortunately, there is no way to bind certain items or spells onto buttons, which was very disappointing. Allowing this would have been a huge blessing considering that so much of the gameplay involves monotonous navigation through menus. The visuals in this game are pretty in line for what you would expect from an SNES title from 1993. The colors are pretty vibrant, and the animations were skillfully made for the time. One factor that stands out when it comes to the graphics are the impressive look of the bosses. They are generally huge in size, and this made them pretty intimidating. Because they were few in number, the boss encounters in Secret of Mana were really something special, and each boss had unique attack patterns and abilities that presented a challenge. Secret of Mana also makes use of Mode 7 effectively when the group is fired out of cannons, a primary method of long-range transportation. It also does so to an even greater extent when the group receives the ability to fly via Flamie, a white dragon. Because Mode 7 was one of the most noteworthy graphical innovations of the SNES, it was good to see it put to use in this game. Story-wise, the game revolves around a hero named Randy from Podos Village. He and a group of boys defy their elders' orders and travel to a nearby waterfall, where legend has it that a treasure is located. Unexpectedly, Randy falls from a bridge and into a lake, where a voice calls out to him to pull a sword from its position in a pond. When he does so, he inadvertently releases teams of monsters into the world. When the villagers catch wind of this, the deed is portrayed as a threat to the safety of the village, and Randy is exiled from Podos. Eventually, he learns from a powerful knight named Gemma that the weapon is the fabled Mana Sword, and that its true power can only be unlocked by visiting eight mana temples throughout the game. Along his journey, he recruits a girl named Prim, a fighter from the Kingdom of Pandora, and also a magic-using sprite named Popoi, memory loss. 
The team is pursued by a powerful emperor that hopes to undermine the trio, but it's later learned that the empire is being manipulated by Thanatos, an ancient sorcerer who hopes to create a new world in his own image. One aspect of Secret of Mana that continues to receive acclaim is the game's soundtrack. Especially for its time, the musical score blew people away for its complexity and infectious melodies. In the development process, composer Hiroki Kikuta said that he tried to fit the songs into the areas of the game that they'd be used in. Also, he uniquely made his own samples of instruments rather than creating them through sound engineering. As far as standout tracks go, I think Fear of the Heavens, Secret of Mana's unofficial theme of sorts, is breathtaking. Its soothing melody was amazingly catchy and still remains in my head more than 25 years after playing the game for the first time. The manner in which the game made use of the SNES sound chip was actually quite great and still holds up today. I think one of the most underappreciated parts of Secret of Mana is the game's support for cooperative play. With two controllers, each player can control one of the three characters, which really allowed the game to be enjoyed with friends, something almost no other RPG allowed. What's more was that it was actually possible for three players to play simultaneously via the Super Multitap accessory, which really was revolutionary. In fact, I really can't think of an RPG that made better use of multiplayer capability for its era. While Secret of Mana was an incredible game, I happen to think that Seiken Densetsu 3, which would have been called Secret of Mana 2 had it been released here, was actually a better game. While Squaresoft was planning to release it in North America, some snags in localization including data limitations prevented that from ever happening. It's a real shame too because the game was truly a step forward for the series. The sequel allowed the player to choose their party from among six possible characters, while also selecting one to serve as the lead character. This meant that character development and story in Seiken Densetsu 3 was greatly expanded. Fortunately for North American gamers, Square Enix finally published Trials of Mana, the renamed Secret of Mana 2, for the Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, and Windows in 2020. As a 3D remake of the original game, it retains most of the storyline, while providing an up-to-date experience. I haven't played this version of the game at all, but from all accounts, it was honorably done. As awesome as the game is, I do have a few general criticisms of Secret of Mana. The first is that the allied character AI is just horrendous. There'll be times in which the characters you aren't controlling just stand idly, get stuck in various locations, and act in quizzical ways that don't assist you at all. To be fair, this was probably the most difficult part of the game for the developers to code for, but I'd like to think it could have been done better. The other gripe I have is the lack of character development. Outside of a few moments here and there, all three characters, the hero, the sprite, and girl, are all relatively uninteresting characters that lack personality and have little real growth. The gameplay does make up for this omission, but people that are used to RPGs with epic storylines may feel let down after trying this one. The story actually did utilize some good ideas, but I don't think Secret of Mana allowed the player to empathize with the characters in the same ways you would find in some of the seminal RPGs. The English translation was done by Ted Woolsey in only 30 days, which was an incredible time constraint for a game such as this. Also, data limitations forced about 40% of the game's original planned story to be cut, which one developer said would have been quite a bit darker than the finished product. Given that English translations for Japanese characters typically takes up more space on screen as it is, I can see why this flaw came to be. For those that didn't get to enjoy Secret of Mana originally, Square Enix gave the game a complete graphical overhaul and re-released it in 2018. Now available on the PlayStation 4, PlayStation Vita, and Windows, this opened up the game to a whole new generation of fans. Even though I haven't played this version, I know it's received some criticism. Either way, I do think that the original SNES version stands the test of time and is still more than playable. So that's the one I recommend. For many fans, Secret of Mana was a gateway drug of sorts into the RPG world. The gameplay was intense enough that fans of action and adventure games could test the waters with it, while RPG fans were willing to jump on board for its leveling and weapon skill advancement system. Secret of Mana was also a game that influenced others that followed in its footsteps. One title that inherited many of the game's characteristics was Secret of Evermore. Even though that game is a bit polarizing, the combat and menu systems are strikingly similar and many fans that played it were already familiar with what to expect after having played Secret of Mana. 
two years after Romancing Saga was released, Square capitalized on its success by releasing its sequel, Romancing Saga 2, in December of 1993. It represented a big step forward for the series in several ways, especially graphically. Even so, the title retained many of the same elements that made the first Romancing Saga game stand out in the Super Famicom's early period. Of course, Romancing Saga 2 wasn't released to a North American audience on the SNES, so it truly lurked in the shadows of RPG history for decades. Over the years, various teams produced incomplete English translation patches, but the game was never fully translated. Unfortunately, this caused Romancing Saga 2 to become forgotten by most Western enthusiasts. That was, however, until Square Enix remastered the game in 2017 and released it on several modern platforms, including Steam, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. The new version uses classic sprites, but improves the environments to fit the widescreen view, revamps the menus, incorporates a brand new English script, completely remasters the original soundtrack, and even adds some animated enemies. All the main storyline and character details remain totally intact. Let me just make one thing clear right here. I was extremely critical of the Minstrel Song re-release of the original Romancing Saga game. But believe me when I say that the Romancing Saga 2 remaster is exceptionally good. It's the definitive way to enjoy the game now, and it doesn't revolutionize the title to such an extent that old school retro fanatics like me would be alienated. The classic feel is still here. Combat in Romancing Saga 2 works a lot like it does in the original Romancing Saga game. You can choose to attack or use a host of abilities against enemies each turn, and your HP and MP are refilled after each battle. The damage you deal and take is greatly influenced by the formations of your characters, which are preset in this one, but there are still three rows. You start with only one formation, but gain more as the game goes along. Formations can help you protect weaker members and amplify the damage of the high damage dealers. It still uses the stat-based advancement system rather than traditional leveling, and players learn new skills through the Glimmer system. This means that you have a chance of learning new abilities in each battle, and the chance of this is increased if you are facing tougher enemies and if you have only a small number of abilities already. You'll know right away when a new ability has been learned in this way because you see a light bulb appear over your character's head, followed by the first use of the new technique. I noticed that I learned many new abilities during boss fights, presumably because they're more difficult. The system is random to some extent, but it's always fun to learn something new out of the blue. The story for Romancing Saga 2 begins as a tale by the unofficial series mascot, Howlon, a bard in a tavern. As he strums his harp, he recounts that the land of Avalon was once a small country fraught with war and conflict. The first emperor, Leon, had two sons, Victor the Brave and Gerard the Kind. As he starts to explain that Leon took Gerard to hunt one day in an evil quarry, the game's events actually begin. The main idea here is that the story narrative takes place over a series of generations. The focal point of the tale is the legend of the Seven Heroes, a group that once rose to banish a great evil long ago, but vanished without a trace afterward. At one point the entire world sang their praises, but with the passage of time, they become totally forgotten. In Romancing Saga 2, the Seven Heroes return to the land, turn into demons, and terrorize the world. As the Emperor of Avalon, it's up to you to put a stop to them. Of course, it's a saga game. So the narrative is pretty loose and you have freedom to explore the world, recruit companions, and complete objectives in a very open-ended order. At several junctures, you're also presented with key decisions that do alter specific parts of the game. Even though Romancing Saga 2's combat system is similar to its predecessor, several other mechanics weren't. For instance, this one uses an innovation called the Inheritance System. This means that during the course of the game, the player controls several different protagonists in succession, starting with the first Emperor of Avalon, Leon. If your entire party is defeated in battle, a long period of time has passed, or Leon's hit points are reduced to zero, the current Emperor will be replaced with a new one in a defined line. 
While it seems like this would make a big difference on the story, it really doesn't very much other than cosmetic differences between the old and new rulers. You also lose the rest of your party, but you're easily able to recruit new companions in each generation with comparable stats anyway. It's all based on an invisible meter that fills up as you play. It is kind of wacky too that you don't even obtain the character you name at the very beginning of the game until way, way later in the story, as he becomes the final emperor. By the time you get him though, you'll probably forget you even named anyone specially. Unlike the first Romancing Saga game, skills aren't directly tied to weapons in this one, so you never have to stress upgrading to a new weapon and losing all of your existing abilities. And if you ask me, this was the best change over the original. It makes it so much more enjoyable to mix and match weapons and abilities without worrying about sacrificing too much. Also, your currency is called crowns, but you don't gain them directly from battle. The number in your treasury is tied to the quests you've completed and the number of battles you've won in the game. You can only carry up to 10,000 crowns at a time for personal use though, and that is a bit odd. But the crowns in your treasury can be used to upgrade your castle to open up new quests and NPCs, which is pretty cool. It reminds me a bit of the castle building you do in the Suikoden games. Kenji Ito produced the soundtrack for Romancing Saga 2, just like the previous game, and I think it sounds great. It's packed with both uplifting and somber tracks, and will be familiar to you if you know his other work. The re-released version of the soundtrack is especially awesome, and really deserves some praise. These tracks were reworked in masterful fashion, and breathed new life into the music. Battle of the Emperor and Encounter with the Seven Heroes are both great songs, but the main theme is probably my absolute favorite. That's the sound most people associate with the Romancing Saga games after all. I would say my gripes with Romancing Saga 2 pretty much match the ones I had with the original. I loved how you could avoid some enemy encounters, but there's just so many enemies packed into various areas that fighting your way through dungeons becomes a real tedious nightmare at times. Parts of this game are also beyond punishing unless you're adequately stat boosted. It's pretty unforgiving and the game really makes you grind. Also, some of the magic spells are just ridiculously overpowered and make the weapon abilities look like a joke. There could have been a lot more balance that went into this. All in all though, Romancing Saga 2 is a really fun RPG, and it was made so much better through the modern remake. Its combat system and abilities are fun to use, and the title is filled with enjoyable fantasy lore and other elements that made the series so unique. The inheritance system was a good idea that made you feel as if you were controlling a kingdom rather than specific characters, but I guess it did have some shortcomings too. The remake also adds a challenging new bonus dungeon and several new classes. There's also a new game plus feature, which is really nice. So yeah, I think Romancing Saga 2 is absolutely worth picking up from Steam for retro RPG fans. I've noticed that it commonly goes on sale there for over 50% off and it's already at a reasonable price, so definitely keep a lookout for those bargains. When you think of Squaresoft, you generally don't think of overhead action adventure games. Sure, Secret of Mana was a huge hit that turned a lot of heads back in the day, but that was pretty unique for them, and it was still an RPG. They were much more well known for their classic RPGs, Final Fantasy, Romancing Saga, and other games. Even titles they published but didn't develop like Breath of Fire, Front Mission, and Treasure Hunter G were much more traditional RPG oriented. Even so, they broke this pattern in 1993 with Alkahest, an overhead action adventure dungeon crawler developed by HAL Laboratory. Square published the game, but it was only released in Japan on the Super Famicom. Thankfully, as in many titles I cover, a fully translated English patch was released in 2002 to make it easily playable for North American gamers. And since I never originally played it on the Super Famicom, this is the way I first experienced it. Unlike traditional RPGs with heaps and heaps of dialogue, there isn't as much text here, and most of the storyline sequences play out pretty quickly. Nevertheless, the patch does a great job at making this one fully playable. I'll leave a link to the translation patch in the description below. 
Alkahest borrows some characteristics from games that came before it, but is completely different in other ways as well. It's structured into eight total stages, and plays much more like a fast-paced arcade game than most console action-adventure titles. It actually plays quite a bit different than it looks, if that makes any sense. Your main weapon is your sword, which you can use to hack away at enemies. You can also hold down the attack button to charge up your sword for a special attack. Outside of your normal attack, you also have SP, otherwise known as special points, to execute companion attacks. And speaking of companions, that's one of the coolest parts of Alkahest. Throughout your adventure, you can acquire various companions that help you fight your way through dungeons. These companions follow you around and do standard attacks based on AI, but you can also press X to unleash a screen-wide attack at the expense of SP. There are five different companions in total, each with different abilities. For instance, Garstein the Magician fires magical bolts at enemies and can do a giant explosion special attack, and Sirius is a knight who attacks with his flail. The last companion, Nevis, can even transform into an actual dragon and breathes fire on all enemies on the screen. Now that is pretty sweet. As you progress, you also gain access to new sword attacks that consume MP, and you can toggle between them with the L and R buttons. For instance, the Guardian of Fire gives you the ability to split into three and execute a series of powerful sword stabs. The Guardian of Water, on the other hand, gives you the ability to perform a spinning attack that fires off magical sparks in all directions. There's a fun assortment of abilities to play with, and quickly pressing a directional button twice makes you dash. That's a nice touch too. The story behind this whole monstrosity is pretty simple. Long ago, a legendary swordsman slew an evil demon god named Alkahest and successfully sealed it away. A thousand years later, a new demon tribe led by Emperor Babylon plans to conquer the world with an imperial army and revive Alkahest. You play the role of Alan, an average guy who happens to be minding his own business when he's chased down by two weird-looking lizard creatures. Just as he's cornered, he's miraculously saved by a guardian and given a sword and shield. As you soon learn, he turns out to be, well, you guessed it, the chosen one to defeat Alkahest and save the world. But he won't do it alone. He has to seek out and enlist the four elemental guardians to help him. Oddly enough, Alkahest gives the appearance of having several RPG elements, what with the experience gauge in the upper left hand corner of the screen and all, but it really isn't an RPG. What shows as experience and next is really just a way to illustrate your progress toward an additional continue, which will help you through the game if you die. So Alkahest doesn't use an RPG leveling system or anything like that. The experience points are more like a traditional arcade's points meter. Alkahest is a pretty short game, and can be beaten in about 4 hours, but there are plenty of areas to explore. There really aren't many puzzles to solve though, and many of the areas are like mazes that you do have to run around in various directions to find keys to proceed. Most of the bosses are pretty sweet, even from the start. Look at this fierce looking fiery armor dude. There's actually some pretty cool design here. The story is definitely cheesy at times, but the dark boss designs aren't. They look sinister and add the perfect type of medieval flavor. Using your companions and special attacks to overcome these guys is where the game's fun truly lies, and there isn't a set way to defeat each one. The only major problem I see is the enemy hit detection is pretty bad. Sometimes it's hard to see where you are in relation to enemies, and swinging your sword in what seems to be the direction of the enemy doesn't always work. You can get a better feel for it as you put more time into the game, but it operates a little like Secret of Mana and Secret of Evermore in this way. The soundtrack gives you about two dozen fun songs that are an upbeat arcade style, definitely different from what you'll find in other SNES action-adventure games. I was pleased with it throughout, and there's enough variety for the various locations so you aren't hearing the same ones over and over like some other SNES titles. I'm actually pretty surprised Squaresoft decided against localizing this one in North America. After all, the title shared some similarities with games like The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, Illusion of Gaia, and Secret of Mana, all of which did very well here. It isn't like there is a ton of text to translate like in their flagship RPG games, so it's not like it would have been a huge burden on staff. 
I guess they felt the game's arcade style wouldn't work too well on console over here, but I think that was a mistake. I know my friends and I would have enjoyed this one a lot. So yeah, Alkahust is a fantastic game that's totally overlooked and unappreciated. It uses a lot of fun concepts that fans of action adventure and RPG games will appreciate, but still stands out in its own way. It's definitely on the short side, and some of the hit detection is frustrating, but it makes up for these things in so many other ways. It also throws a bunch of challenges your way, so it's not like it's a cakewalk or anything like that. If you like games like Arcus Odyssey, Wizard Fire, the Soul Blazer series, and even Magic Sword, I think this one will be right up your alley. It's a fun plug and play game that doesn't require too much thought or effort. It's probably one of the most overshadowed Squaresoft published titles of all time. One year after the original release of the SNES, the system didn't have much to show for RPGs. Final Fantasy IV was released to some fanfare, but didn't sell well in North America. Draken was released to much, much less acclaim, and faded into obscurity. There just weren't that many RPGs at the time, and Capcom wanted to try their hand at creating one in 1993. Enter Breath of Fire, a traditional turn-based game that began an epic franchise. Breath of Fire features random encounters much like most traditional RPGs. Compared to later games, the encounter rate is pretty high too, which seemed normal at the time, but definitely would frustrate modern players. The good thing is that this game incorporated an auto-battle feature that can be used to speed through simple encounters, and can also be cancelled at any time with a press of the B button. Combat is turn-based, and you can have up to four members in your party at one time. The battles take place in an isometric view, which was definitely a novel concept back then. The battle animations for attacks and spells were actually done pretty well, and provided something few other games at the time did. Another thing I liked about this game was that each enemy, even the bosses, have a visual health bar that decreases as they take damage. This was especially helpful because it allowed players to plan their attacks accordingly. Spells require ability points, which serve as Breath of Fire's version of magic points. Breath of Fire has received some criticism for requiring a lot of grinding to level. Indeed, you can get absolutely wrecked if you travel too far without leveling a bit and upgrading your gear. In all honesty though, most RPGs of this era were like this, and it certainly didn't stand out as an extreme deviation from the norm. However, if you only like RPGs where you can avoid enemies on the screen or random encounters in general, this may be a problem for you. Like most games of its kind, the title uses anime-style artwork. Though there are some dark moments in the story, most of the sprites are pretty bright and colorful. The color palette doesn't come off as dark as, say, Final Fantasy VI. Because the game was released relatively early in the SNES's life cycle, it unfortunately lacks some of the graphical enhancements later games made use of, such as non-battle sprite animations. Overall, I think the best aspect of Breath of Fire was the music. The score is nostalgic and memorable, and when I returned to play the game, it brought back many memories. The intro, called Starting the Journey, is definitely one of my favorites, and its uplifting and triumphant feeling leaves the player with an impression that an epic quest is ahead of them. For an early era SNES RPG, the soundtrack was great. Breath of Fire's story revolves around clans based on legendary creatures and animals. The main protagonist, Ryu, is part of the Dragon Clan, a group that's been driven to near extinction by the Dark Dragon Clan. Real creative, right? As a young orphan, Ryu was taken care of by his sister, Sarah, who can use powerful summoning magic. However, their village is soon set ablaze by Emperor Zog and the Dark Dragon Clan, and Sarah is taken captive while trying to save the clan. Along his adventure, Ryu meets several allies, including the dog-like Bo, Karn the Thief, the angel-like Nina, a fish creature named Gobi, a naga named Blue, a strongman named Ox, and the mole-like Mogu. They all work together in various ways to overcome adversity and have character development similar to what you would find in Final Fantasy IV. The other cool facet of the various characters is that each has a special skill that can be used on the world map. This allows you to find special items, discover secret passages, and even fly around the world. Unfortunately, I do think the game's English translation suffers quite a bit. The game was published by Squaresoft, but at that point, the company didn't pour great resources into localization efforts, a cold truth that can be seen from the earliest moments of the game. 
Most RPGs of this era, including some of the most popular titles like Secret of Mana and Final Fantasy VI, were translated by one or two people in extremely small windows of time. This made it almost impossible to guarantee a quality English translation, and Breath of Fire is the perfect example. Breath of Fire's other glaring defect, I think, is the fact that there is so little text space for item names. Because the Japanese language can be used to convey meaning with much less space, the translators were forced to shorten the English item names to the point where they're almost indecipherable. Breath of Fire didn't get too much acclaim from what I remember at the time, though it was featured in Volume 62 of Nintendo Power. At that time, RPGs just really hadn't taken off in the West like they did in Japan through the Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy series. The good thing about playing Breath of Fire today is that there's a Game Boy Advance version of the game that adds several beneficial changes. That version adds a dash button, made the menus a little bit better, and lowered the overall encounter rate. The items still have shortened names, which is annoying, but the GBA counterpart is still superior in many ways. Ultimately, Breath of Fire was the first in what became a very well-recognized series of six RPGs. All the games are spiritual successors of each other too, with similar themes like Dragon Clan, Ryu as the lead protagonist, and a medieval fantasy style. While I think the earlier games in the series were actually better, the franchise as a whole is widely respected among RPG enthusiasts. As a series, Breath of Fire still gets some notoriety today, and fans often request that it be rebooted. Overall, Breath of Fire is a quintessential early 90s RPG. It has a fantasy story, with a lively cast of characters and an epic-oriented soundtrack. A first playthrough will last you about 30 hours, which is pretty solid for an SNES game. The game's also very cheap compared to other RPGs on the system, which is great news for collectors. While I don't think the game is a true masterpiece as far as RPGs go, it was an honorable first dive into the genre by Capcom, and will still please fans of the genre that haven't gotten around to playing it before. Released in 1994 for the Super NES, Final Fantasy VI has consistently generated hype and acclaim from fans of console RPGs. The second installment of the series on the system, it is regularly invoked as one of the greatest games in the genre, and it is still played often today. Brought to North America as Final Fantasy III, it has gained critical praise and continues to be considered a bright spot for the series. For the first time in the history of Final Fantasy, Hironobu Sakaguchi took an auxiliary role in the game's development, as Yoshinori Kitase and Hiroyuki Ito took over as co-directors. However, Sakaguchi did contribute significantly to the story in his role as producer, and created the characters of Terra and Locke. Yoshitaka Amano designed the characters as he had done since the very beginning of the series. Per usual, Final Fantasy mainstay Nobuo Uematsu created the game's soundtrack. The story revolves around Terra, who is named Tina in the Japanese version. Terra is a brainwashed Magitek knight controlled by Kefka, the chief adversary in the game. Kefka is part of the Gestalian Empire, a supreme body that seeks to capture espers, magical creatures, to extract their essences and revive magic, a mystical force that has been mostly dormant since an ancient conflict called the War of the Magi. Through magic, Gestal and Kefka seek to control the world and expand their power. Under the Empire's control in the beginning, Terra is sent to Narsh, a mining city, to capture an Esper. As Terra approaches the Esper, she falls under a mental spell. She is eventually saved by a sympathizer of the Returners, a group of rebels committed to thwarting the Empire's plans. The story does much to explore Terra's past, her identity, and her role in the future of the world. However, it's important to note that the game was specifically designed such that most of the protagonists are all important characters, each with their own significant personal stories that contribute to the plot. There are some exceptions to this, however. Some characters, such as Gogo and Yumero, are not explored very well. Overall, though, this is a unique facet of the game that has been rarely utilized in the Final Fantasy series to the same extent. When it comes to graphics, the game is certainly a big step up from the previous installments in the series. In comparison to the blockier sprites and battle graphics in Final Fantasy IV and V, Final Fantasy VI looks a lot more crisp and vibrant. It was also the only game in the series to feature the same sprites for both exploration and in battle. 
This adds a more consistent look to Final Fantasy VI compared to its predecessors. Also, the game expanded upon the basic sprite gestures and emotional reactions used in Final Fantasy V, and characters now react to various scenes and dialogue through intense sprite animations. As far as soundtracks go, the game provides a huge score, Uematsu's biggest ever, that captures every mood of the story effectively. From the opening theme onward, the game's songs will stick in your head for good. Uematsu's trademark use of melody is especially prevalent and can be heard in songs like Terra's Theme, Epitaph, and Locke's Theme. Dancing Mad, the song played during the last battle, is also considered a series highlight. In my estimation, it is one of the best video game soundtracks ever, let alone RPG scores. Uematsu personally admitted that he was very pleased by the way the soundtrack turned out. Referring to Final Fantasy VI, he said, With the satisfaction and excitement I felt after finishing that project, I thought I had reached my primary goal, and could quit doing game music with no regrets. The Esper system was also unique and interesting, and allowed for a certain degree of customization that wasn't possible in former games in the series. For instance, you could make one character into a healer and another into the team's offensive magic user. Magic remains with the character after each spell is mastered. This creates a customization double-edged sword though, as almost every character can learn all the magic. Characters also gain special skill-up bonuses when they level, depending on the Esper that's equipped. Espers can also be utilized during battles, and act similarly to summon magic in the previous Final Fantasy games. Summoning an Esper usually damages all enemies or protects the party in some way. Outside of the Esper and magic system, each character is locked into a special skill. For example, Terra can use Morph, which vastly increases her magic power for a duration. Edgar can use powerful tools to do damage to enemies. Locke can steal items from enemies. Sabin can utilize Blitz, a series of martial arts attacks that inflict damage. In this way, the game locks the characters into somewhat defined roles while still allowing for the customization of the Espers. This creates a pretty good balance in Final Fantasy VI in my opinion. Probably the most mind-blowing aspect of the game is the story. Some of the traditional elements of a classic RPG are here, such as an evil empire and a group of rebels, but the game handles these archetypes well through its changing tides and plot twists. Most of the characters are pretty complex and likable, each with their own contribution to the tale. I found the stories of Shadow, Locke, and Celeste to be especially interesting. The story of the Espers and their history is also one of the most infatuating elements of the storyline adding color to the narrative and breaking some RPG stereotypes. At first, the player is generally led to believe that the game is more about the Gestalian Empire and its thirst for power. But as the game unfolds, it ends up being more about the Espers and their role in creating world balance than anything else. In almost every way, the game's story is darker and more interesting than its predecessors. Unlike the relatively cheery Final Fantasy V, for instance, Final Fantasy VI includes several deaths throughout the story. The game also references mass poisoning, suicide, etc. This change was relatively new for the series, but it works out incredibly well in Final Fantasy VI. The game's main villain, Kefka, is certainly a unique antagonist by RPG standards. Hardly physically imposing, Kefka can be characterized more as a zealous lunatic with an intense lust for power. Toward the beginning of the game, he seems to be more of a dimwit than an actual adversary. Of course, that changes completely once his plans for world domination unfold. To all that have played the game, Kefka's laugh is an unmistakable fixture. By far, his presence is one of the most recognizable aspects of the game. If I had just one qualm with this game, it is that the difficulty level makes it a bit too easy. Most of the bosses can be beaten using the same powerful magic spells and attacks that your team has using healing sporadically. Some bosses have immunities, but these can generally be overcome, figured out, and circumvented. There are some very difficult encounters though, such as the boss of the Fanatic's Tower, which is very nice. Unfortunately, there are also a few ridiculous bugs that allow players to defeat almost every enemy in the game, including bosses, with a simple Vanish Doom or Vanish X-Zone magic combination. This was a definite oversight on the part of the game's developers, but thankfully it doesn't affect the average gamer too much. Final Fantasy VI offers a huge variety of side content, especially in the later parts of the game. 
The best magic spell, weapons, and side stories are not mandatory and must be discovered by the player's own volition. Unlike many other games in the genre, you don't even have to obtain all the characters after the cataclysm that alters the world in the middle of the game. The World of Ruin leaves much of the sequence of events up to the player, including the time where Kefka is confronted. In fact, it is possible to challenge Kefka only after having found a few of the characters in the World of Ruin. This was a refreshing new change for the series that helped those who felt that RPGs were way too linear and structured. The game's translation is also not fantastic, but that isn't all on Squaresoft. Ted Woolsey's English translation had to adhere to Nintendo's strict code of standards regarding content. And when it came to Nintendo's standards, strict is an understatement. For instance, in Towns the lettering bar was changed to cafe, and the spell holy was even renamed to pearl. Several religious references were removed, and some of Kefka's spoken threats are mild compared to the original game. Some of the enemy and esper sprites were also altered to add more clothing in the US version. Bar none, Final Fantasy VI is one of the best games in the series, and one of the most complete RPGs ever created. I personally think this game shines above any other SNES title, and is quite possibly my favorite game ever created. Each characteristic of the game complements the others, from the story, to the characters, the music, and the battles. It really keeps the player's attention throughout. It is by no mistake that the game is routinely played and praised decades after its inception and often streamed online. One of the most common criticisms that classic RPGs receive is that their storylines are always pre-calculated, so their biggest moments invariably play out in the same predictable order. Well, not so with Live Alive from Squaresoft. This one very literally gives the player full discretion over the order of the game's scenarios all of which are thematically different and exciting to see in the context of a single game. While Live Alive was never officially released in North America, the great folks at Aeon Genesis translated the game in 2008. This now allows all of us to enjoy this awesome game via a translation patch. And it's a true blessing because this was one of the greatest RPGs North American fans missed out on in the SNES era. When you first start up the game, you're given the immediate freedom to select from one of seven different scenarios each of which features a different protagonist that the scenario centers upon. Each chapter plays as something of a standalone game, and the player can complete the scenarios in any order. The sci-fi scenario, for instance, features a robot named Cube that was created on a spaceship. As the ship makes its way to Earth, there are many surprises that befall the crew, and it's up to Cube to save the day. With characters named Kirk and Darth, one can imagine what influenced this one. There's also some really crazy surprises in this scenario, but I shouldn't spoil them here. Another chapter takes place in feudal Japan, and you control a ninja named Oboro with incredible powers. Here, the villain Ode and his minions plan to thwart the ninjas and dominate Japan. The chief objective is to invade an enemy fortress, use stealth to evade the many traps and enemies, and stop Ode. The wrestling scenario features a martial artist named Masaru, who is training to be the world's greatest fighter. He enters a global tournament to test his might against various competitors, including, uh, Hulk Hogan? This one doesn't have an overworld to wander around in, and is comprised simply of a series of matches. One of my favorites was the Cowboy Chapter, which is influenced by the Wild West in America. Here, you take control of Sundown, who works to set up traps to take out the town's gang of ruffians. The protagonist doesn't say much, but using traps was just a ton of fun, and it was pretty hysterical when you set them off against the Crazy Bunch gang. In the Mecha Chapter, you play as a dude named Akira that can read minds. With the help of his psychic powers, Akira sets out to save an orphan that has been taken by a biker gang. The futuristic flavor here was distinct from the robot one, and it was quite fun in its own right. The monk scenario features Shin Chan Chuan, a fighting master who seeks to teach his skills to one of his three pupils before he dies. In this one, you seek out his students, train them in combat, help a local village cure a mysterious disease, and deal with an evil clan that attempts to hinder the monk's plans. Perhaps the most unique is the Caveman chapter, where you play as Pogo. In this chapter, there's no actual dialogue, and you just set out to solve a series of squabbles between caveman tribes that communicate only by pictures and gestures. Even without an actual script, there's some real themes at play here, including exile and cooperation. After completing all seven of the original scenarios, Live Alive provides a true surprise to the player by introducing a medieval-themed eighth chapter. In this scenario, a new hero named Orstad must save a kidnapped princess from the demon king Odio. This one concludes with an incredibly surprising twist. 
This chapter was by far my favorite, and it is dark. You'll see why when you play through it. In the final chapter, the player chooses a main character from among all those in the previous eight scenarios. Here, the paths of all the characters intersect with each other. There's a lot of surprises in the conclusion, and I won't spoil anything, but I will say the game is definitely worth playing to this point. In fact, it just keeps getting better and better the closer you get to the end. The storyline sequencing feature wasn't the only innovative aspect of Live Alive. For combat, Squaresoft ventured away from the standard system adopted by the Final Fantasy and Romancing Saga series. Here, all the battles take place on a 7x7 grid. Characters can move around on their turn at will, but during movement, enemies can move and attack you as well. Each character has unique attacks, all of which have special distance and direction requirements. Some attacks have an effect radius that takes up many squares, whereas others only focus on a single square. The way the combat plays out is almost like chess, and Live Alive definitely requires you to think on your feet and take position into consideration. It's strategy-oriented and has some elements similar to what you can find in Tactics Ogre. There are also no magic points of any type, but there are certain drawbacks built into each attack. For instance, some moves take some time to charge up, and you can be attacked by enemies in the meantime. Like the Romancing Saga series, your characters return to full hit points after all battles, a welcome change that eliminated the need for tedious inventory management. And speaking of inventory, there actually aren't many weapons or armors that characters can buy, and there are very few stores. You gain almost all armor and weapons in the game from hidden locations or defeating enemies. One of the most glorious aspects of the Aeon Genesis translation was its ingenious decision to use a different font for each scenario each of which was crafted to fit the theme of that scenario specifically. This was a creative decision that added flavor to the localization, and I definitely wanted to bring attention to it. Also, some of the text in Live Alive is downright hilarious, and you can tell that the translators worked hard to make this translation a great success. Aeon Genesis really deserves a lot of credit for creating such an awesome translation. I can't stress that enough. Like several other Squaresoft RPGs, the soundtrack to Live Alive is one of its greatest assets. In fact, I was quite surprised to learn that it wasn't arranged by the legendary composers Nobuo Uematsu or Yasunori Mitsuda. Instead, the score was created by Yoko Shimomura, who worked with Capcom prior to Squaresoft. Her work on this one was just really well done. Live Alive's soundtrack contains 41 distinct songs. I was very impressed how well the tunes were matched to their respective scenarios, which must have been a challenge. The main theme of the game hits you right away with an epic punch and just sets the mood for the story. The Sound of Shinobi, which plays during the Secret Order scenario, is also fantastic. Also noteworthy is Nice Weather, ain't it? Which was the overworld theme in the Caveman scenario, and it's still stuck in my head now. Finally, Sundown's theme, and frankly all the music in the Wild West chapter for that matter, is excellent. Several tunes from Orsted's story were also memorable as well. There's so many amazing songs in Live Alive, and overall they complemented the characteristics of each chapter. This is a very underrated soundtrack. In general, Live Alive's graphics are pretty comparable to what you would find in Final Fantasy V, but I'd say the graphics in battle are quite a bit better. The visuals won't blow you out of the water or anything, but they're definitely respectable. The quality that stands out the most in this area is the battle animations, because many are completely unique, and this is something a lot of the other SNES RPGs didn't do. My one gripe with Live Alive is that the game is especially short for an RPG. This is presumably because the distinct scenarios required a lot of data. Because of this, you can definitely beat the game in 15 to 20 hours. Regardless, I thought the variety that the game offers is a fair trade-off for the lack of playtime. It was a true shame that the West missed out on this one because Live Alive might have been one of the best RPGs Squaresoft released outside of their flagship series. All respects paid to Chrono Trigger, of course. The characters are likable, the storylines were well designed, and the game concludes in such an interesting way. There are also some really comical moments, which added life to the game and was a real pleasure to see. In terms of Japan-only SNES RPGs, I rank it up there with games like Seiken Densetsu 3, Far East of Eden Zero, and even Final Fantasy V. If you never got a chance to play this one at the time, I highly recommend it. In the early 1990s, mecha vehicle simulation games were all the rage. This trend was driven by games like Star Cruiser, Mech Warrior, and Target Earth, all of which embraced futuristic themes and packaged them into action simulation experiences. The craze got so big at one point that leading arcade and console developers started to borrow these themes and put them into their own games, such as Capcom with Cyberbot's Full Metal Madness. 
Everybody's doing it, so why not do it better than everybody else? That's what Squaresoft said anyway, so the legendary RPG developer decided to put its own twist on the trend with Front Mission, which came out on the Super Famicom in 1995. Unfortunately for North American RPG fanatics at the time, and I was one of those, the title was never localized for the SNES. Thankfully though, a fully translated English patch was later developed by List Translations, and it's fantastic. I'll include a link to the translation patch in the comments below. At its most basic level, Front Mission's gameplay combines mecha simulation elements with strategy RPG gameplay you'll find in Tactics Ogre and the Fire Emblem games. You'll witness storyline sequences with dialogue, but most of the meat and potatoes comes in the form of strategic battles, where you control units on a grid. Most battles require you to defeat all enemies, and like most other tactical RPGs, you can move a unit and perform one action on each of their turns. Nothing real unexpected here if you're familiar with the genre. However, Front Mission does offer some unique facets when it comes to the gameplay as well. Throughout the adventure, the player's chief responsibility here is to equip their army of mechs, which are called Wanzers, with various weapons and armor to overcome the game's challenges. Each Wanzer has four slots, body, left arm, right arm, and legs. You can buy parts for your Wanzers, as well as items for healing and other things, at the Wanzer shops. There are four types of weapons, melee weapons, short-ranged weapons, long-ranged weapons, and support fire weapons. There are clubs, rifles, machine guns, grenade launchers, flamethrowers, and all sorts of other stuff. It's awesome. When you make these choices, you have to take weight and power output into consideration as well, so there are some limitations to work around. Usage frequency determines how strong your weapons become, so if a Wanzer uses machine guns often, its close range attack will improve over time. The same goes for all other weapon types as well. It's the whole learn by doing concept. You can also obtain computers that augment the power of your weapons. Shields can also be equipped to deflect enemy barrages. Outside of customization, there is another unique element that sets this one apart from other tactical RPGs. And that is that each Wanzer part has its own health bar, and enemy Wanzers mostly reflect the characteristics of your own. You can defeat units completely by destroying their body, but you can also target enemy weapons to disable them instead, or enemy legs to hinder their mobility. There's lots of strategic choices. To me, the best part of Front Mission is the fun that comes through customizing your weapons and building your own crew of specialized mechs. This guarantees each player's experience with the game will be a little different, and it encourages experimentation, something not found in many other strategy RPGs. As far as the story goes, you play as Lloyd, also translated as Royd in some versions, who becomes involved in a complex struggle over Huffman Island. Two political factions, the Oceana Community Union and the United States of the New Continent, maintain claims over the territory. When Lloyd is sent by the OCU to lead an illegal mission into enemy territory, his fiancée Karen is captured in an ambush. The perpetrator is Driscoll, a USN commander who serves as the title's chief antagonist. After years of disgrace over the failed operation, Lloyd is recruited by a mercenary unit to seek vengeance. Overall, the story contains a lot of sad elements. It's honestly pretty depressing at times. I think the graphics look pretty good for their era, as do the animations. The isometric view gives the player the feeling they're in a large world, and I was pretty impressed how the game featured a variety of settings, all of which look different from each other. For instance, there's this cool urban metropolis area, this jungle area, and also these wooded foothills. I also think it's pretty cool how the game switches into more of a one-on-one -on -one view when Wanzers clash, unlike other games where all the action takes place on the same grid. The soundtrack for Front Mission was created by legendary composer Yoko Shimomura, who created many other noteworthy soundtracks such as those for Alive Alive, Super Mario RPG, and Legend of Mana. I don't think Front Mission's soundtrack is quite as great as Live Alive's, but it's worthy in its own right and definitely adopts her trademark style. If you played those games, I think you'll recognize her work right away here. 
The great thing about Front Mission for people that missed out on it long ago is that the game was recently remade as Front Mission First Remake for the Nintendo Switch and released in November of 2022. This version gives the game user interface and graphical improvements, but retains most of the classic gameplay elements and story. I haven't played this version, but I sure am thankful that Square Enix has brought it back for North American fans to enjoy in an official capacity. It's some serious mecha necromancy. If you played it, leave me a comment below and just let me know if it lives up to the original, or tell me what it changes. Regardless of which version you play, Front Mission is a more than worthy game to sink some time into today. It's a fun strategy RPG that embraces some creative ideas within that subgenre and presents a darker story than the lighthearted games of this time. Its difficulty level is just right, customizing the Wanzers is super addicting, and the soundtrack rules. It'll give you about 25 to 30 hours of strategy RPG greatness and the simulation elements make it stand out from a lot of other games of the era. I'm a definite fan and recommend this one highly. Perhaps no other Super NES role-playing game has had the longevity and hype of Chrono Trigger. Played and replayed by fans for decades, Chrono Trigger has become one of the most popular games in the entire genre, and it is continually recognized as one of the best Super NES games ever. Undoubtedly, Chrono Trigger did much to shape our own conceptions of what a role-playing game truly should be. It has also continued to captivate the minds of millions of gamers. The game's development team included some of the most very famous people in the gaming industry. It all started when Hironobu Sakaguchi, the creator of the Final Fantasy series, Yuji Horii, the creator of the Dragon Quest series, and Akira Toriyama, famous artist of Dragon Quest and Dragon Ball, all got together and decided to collaborate on a game to be published by Squaresoft. Kazuhiko Aoki produced the game, and Masato Kato took the lead role in writing the plot. Yasunori Mitsuda contributed most of the soundtrack. If there ever was an RPG dream team, the group that produced this game was it. The game's central premise, time travel, was continually debated from the start of production. In various brainstorm sessions, designer Masato Kato felt that time travel would lead to repetitive gameplay and boring scenarios. However, he was eventually swayed to adopt the theme, fully dedicated to making it work. Also, the decision that Chrono would never speak was also controversial among the development team. In the end, it was decided that the only proper choice was to make it so that Chrono never talked, as it would allow the player to view himself as the protagonist of the story. The team deliberately structured the game in such a way as to avoid a long string of errands that included retrieving certain items or defeating particular monsters. Gasper was originally envisioned as a playable character, but he was cut from a starring role early on. Also, it was originally intended that Chrono would remain dead throughout the entire story, a vision that was reversed when Squaresoft determined that this would make the game way too depressing. The game's story begins as Chrono wakes up and heads to the Millennial Fair to visit his friend Luca, who has built a contraption that sends people from one place to another. He runs into a girl, Marl, who is actually the Queen of Guardia. When they find Luca, Marl's pendant reacts to the machine. Suddenly, there's a malfunction and the two are sent back in time. Chrono finds that he must save Marl's ancestor to make things right in his timeline. Eventually, it is revealed that the world was destroyed by a creature named Lavos in 1999, and Chrono and his friends decide to devote themselves to doing everything within their power to end his reign of destruction. Unlike many of the other games in the genre, there are no random battles in Chrono Trigger. Instead, enemies that are bumped into start a battle sequence. This was a breath of fresh air to many people turned off to role-playing games due to the annoyance of random battles. For one of the first times in role-playing game history, battles also take place in the exact locations in which enemies are encountered. This created a more consistent, streamlined approach that pleased many. Battles allow for the usage of techs, where characters can spend magic points to perform special attacks. Different character combinations unlock different techs, and there are both double and triple ones. This adds another fun feature to the game, and changes depending on your group composition. A lot of the fun in the game comes from learning which characters work well with others, and how to construct the best team to handle each situation. 
As far as the graphics go, the sprites are bold and vibrant, and the overall look is fantastic for a game that came out in 1995. Toriyama did an incredible job at designing the characters, and the battle animations are especially great. Enemy Strikes also have animations, which was a unique departure from most previous role-playing games. Speaking of the characters, the cast is certainly one of the best for any RPG ever. There aren't too many characters to make the story too cumbersome, and the ones that exist in the game each add a unique facet to the storyline. In captivating fashion, the game slowly reveals the motivations behind each of the characters bit by bit to create its impressive narrative. For instance, the zeal sequence taught us a lot about Magus that we didn't know before. Ah, and then there's the soundtrack. Yasunori Mitsuda poured his soul into this soundtrack, creating an incredible array of songs to fit the game's various time frames and situations. According to reports, Mitsuda actually worked so tirelessly on this game that he put in long hours into the night, even waking up at times with sudden inspiration for new tracks. Too sick to finish the last songs, Final Fantasy mainstay Nobuo Uematsu chipped in a few last songs to complete the soundtrack. A few of my favorite songs for this soundtrack include the Zeal theme, Magus' theme, and the Chrono Trigger main theme, all of which are featured in this video. By far, this is one of the best SNES soundtracks, or maybe game soundtracks, ever. Trust me, if you play this game, these songs will get stuck in your head. The game's story is also a shining example of what an RPG should offer. It really is fascinating and never fails to keep you hooked. Events that take place in the past shape the future and alter the course of events in a way that affects the way the story pans out. Almost every plot element introduced throughout the story is of high importance, and there's virtually no filler or boring scenarios to speak of. When I initially played this game, there were several times that I planned to stop, but just had to keep playing because I was so gripped and hooked by the story. The game also does an incredible job of making the player think one way about certain characters and situations, but then makes them rethink those positions with a bit more information as the story progresses. Frog, Magus, and Gasper are excellent examples of this. I found Magus' intentions and motivations to be especially interesting. The way the game works, there are also various secret items you can obtain only if conditions from the past would make them available in the future. The attention to detail and continuity between the time periods must have taken meticulous discipline and is easily one of the best aspects of the game. Undoubtedly, one of the best and most unique facets of Chrono Trigger is its ending system. Instead of a single ending, the game provides multiple endings that depend on the circumstances through which the player beats the game. The game actually gives you great control over when you challenge Lavos, which drives the different endings. There are 13 endings in total, and some are much more difficult to obtain than the others. In one ending, for instance, everyone including Chrono and his mother are lizards because the lizards triumphed over the humans in the ancient past. In another, Robo runs into his sweetheart in Lean Square in the future, where the bell is still prominently displayed. In yet another ending, Magus as the prophet decides to confront Lavos, choosing to exact vengeance upon him for ruining everything he knew and loved. There is even a secret developer team ending where each of the developers of the game appears as a sprite to converse with the winning player. The variety of endings was truly an exceptional marvel. It sets Chrono Trigger apart from other games in the genre and certainly adds to the replayability. There's almost no other RPG like this and it's really quite awesome. Another great feature of the game, New Game Plus, allows players to start the game over after having beaten it allowing them to progress through the story once again with the same stats, levels, and items. This is a highly enjoyed feature that added a huge amount of replay value and kept gamers interested in the game long after its original release. Of all the great aspects of Chrono Trigger, this one continues to draw attention, and many fans recommend the feature to be placed in other games as well, using Chrono Trigger as an example. And really, replay value seemed to be what the development team had been aiming at the entire time. Hironobu Sakaguchi seemed to be alluding to this when he said the following, quote, Wherever we could, we tried to make it so that a slight change in your behavior caused subtle differences in people's reactions, even down to the smallest details. I think the second playthrough will hold a whole new interest. 
One of the gripes some players had with Chrono Trigger surrounds its difficulty. Some have alleged that the game is simply too hard, with unpredictable boss mechanics and challenging encounters. To this charge, I can't fully agree. Some of the bosses are definitely difficult, like Magus and the Golem Twins, but most of the game isn't nearly that hard. My only minor criticism of the game is in regard to its length. A typical first playthrough lasts only about 25 hours, which is a bit less than some of the other RPGs on the system. However, the game makes up for the relatively short story with lots of bonus content. There are actually quite a few significant bonus storylines to follow, and they actually have tangible relevance to the overall plot of the game. This made it seem like the side quests were actually part of the game, rather than just throwaway scenarios. The game was a bestseller both in Japan and in the United States, where millions of copies were sold in 1995 alone. Nintendo Power, GameFAQs, Game Informer, and GameSpot have all included Chrono Trigger in greatest games of all time lists. The game is still often played today and even streamed online, and it draws the attention of the speedrun community. Bar none, Chrono Trigger is one of the best role-playing games in history. The few defects it has are clearly outshined by the bright spots, and I still like playing the game today. In my mind, the only RPG on the system in the same realm is Final Fantasy VI. I think Chrono Trigger deserves all the praise that it continues to get, and even more. In 1993, Squaresoft released Secret of Mana, a game that defined the action RPG genre. Its fast-paced gameplay, amazing soundtrack, and innovative weapon advancement system thrilled many enthusiasts and left them wanting more. It was by luck then that Squaresoft announced the development of Seiken Densetsu 3, a sequel to the game that was planned for a North American release under the title Secret of Mana 2. Several gaming publications covered the game. It was eventually released in Japan in September of 1995, but questions soon began to arise in regard to when it would be released in North America. In December the same year, Nintendo Power Vol. 79 unveiled the heartbreaking news that the game wouldn't be released outside of Japan at all. The article cited technical issues that would have made the game too costly to produce, and several of the game's developers later confirmed the same. One of the main producers on the series also added that the size of the game created data issues that would have made it impossible to properly localize. Fans that had loved Secret of Mana then grew despondent. RPG Fanatics got some amazing news in 2000, though, when an online group completed an English translation of the game. This made it playable via emulation and allowed many fans to experience the game in English for the first time. It was at that point that I first played the game, and what an experience it was. One of the elements that set Secret of Mana 2 apart from its predecessor was the game's class change system. At two points in the game, each of your party's characters has the opportunity to perform a class change. They do so by choosing whether to progress in a light or dark path. This choice is incredibly important too, because the selection determines the set of skills and statistical improvements the character will receive. Because the characters have two separate class change events, they each have four possible class archetypes. For instance, at level 18, Kevin gets the first opportunity to do a class change. If he picks light, he becomes a monk, allowing him to gain some healing magic and a spell that makes him stronger during the day. If he chooses dark at level 18, he'll become a Bashkar, giving him no spells whatsoever, but making him more physically strong. At level 38, he'll be able to class change again, choosing between light and dark regardless of what class he is already. If he goes light twice, for instance, he'll become a god hand, giving him a new spell that can fill up the tech gauge of an ally in addition to his existing spells. On the other hand, if he selects dark twice, he'll become a dervish with incredible power and the moon saber spell that increases an ally's power and allows them to drain life by attacking enemies. In my mind, the class change system was Secret of Mana 2's greatest single innovation. This level of customization enabled each player to build a unique party that differed from other players, and several of the characters could be transformed in very diverse ways. As far as combat goes, Secret of Mana 2 had much in common with Secret of Mana, but does have a few twists. Gone are the attack recharging gauges, replaced instead with visible character animations when a party member is ready to attack again. Also, each character has a rage gauge of sorts that charges up as a battle progresses, 
By pressing the B button when it charges to the appropriate level, the character will unleash a special attack that does extra damage. There are actually multiple tiers of special attacks too, and those that are executed when the gauges are completely full have very impressive visual animations and sometimes unique characteristics. For instance, some special attacks will damage all enemies on the screen at the same time. Another awesome facet of the combat is that each of the characters is just more distinct than those in Secret of Mana. For instance, some of the characters even attack twice in each combat round. My personal favorite character is Kevin, who is incredibly strong and has a double attack. In addition, at nighttime he transforms into a werewolf, increasing his overall power immensely. The game's use of the day-night cycle for this and other things is also one of the most innovative aspects of the game. Graphically, the sprites in Secret of Mana 2 are beautiful, and the developers clearly prioritize creating awesome animations for each of the characters. The spells in this game are also quite incredible. Even though they suffer from some of the same drawbacks as Secret of Mana, namely their usage is tied to the ring menu system, they are definitely better graphically. I can't think of many other games on the system that have spells that are so visually impressive. Also, the opening Mode 7 intro is breathtaking as well. Truly an awesome spectacle that showed off the power of the Super Famicom. In all ways, this is a visual step up from Secret of Mana, and quite possibly one of the most graphically impressive RPGs on the system. In terms of storyline, Secret of Mana 2 is quite a bit darker than its predecessor. Each of the six characters has their own arc, and some of them are quite tragic. Kevin is the offspring of the King of the Beast Kingdom, and a human woman. His unique offspring makes him something of a misfit, and he spends his time with Carl, a wolf pup he saved in the wild. However, a dark wizard called Death Jester soon undermines the Beast Kingdom and threatens everything Kevin holds dear. Hawkeye is a member of Navarre's Thieves Guild. The leader of the guild, Flamecon, unexpectedly declares that the guild is to be a kingdom, which startles the inhabitants. When an evil witch turns out to be behind it all, Hawkeye is forced into a heartbreaking predicament. Duran is a bold swordsman from the kingdom of Forsena. As the son of Loki, a deceased friend of the king, he seeks to confront a crimson wizard that threatens the kingdom. Charlotte is the rebellious granddaughter of the Priest of Light. When her friend Heath is kidnapped by Death Jester, she sets out to save him. Reese is the Princess of Laurent, Kingdom of the Wind. A fighting Amazon, she is taking care of her younger brother Elliot since her mother died giving birth to him. After Elliot is taken by evildoers and the kingdom is attacked by a mysterious force, she sets out for vengeance. Angela is the Princess of the Ice-Covered Kingdom of Altena. Her mother, Queen Valda, is brutally cold to her for her lack of magical skill. The kingdom is soon threatened by the Crimson Wizard, who persuades Valda to invade rival nations and claim their mana stones. What the game did so well with the story, I think, was reveal each character's motivations from the get-go. This made it easy to relate to the characters and progress through the world to accomplish their aims. Every character brought something to the table in terms of the story, and the lack of this characteristic was one qualm I had with Secret of Mana. The leveling system in Secret of Mana 2 is also slightly different from Secret of Mana. Killing enemies still grants each character experience, but in this one, leveling up gives the player a choice about where to allocate stat increases. On top of the class system, this was another supplemental way to customize your party the way you want to. An awesome feature. On some level, it compares to the skill system of Star Ocean, but to a degree of lesser complexity. Also, the game's inventory system and status screen were improved greatly. The new status screen gives the player more options for character AI customization and a streamlined method to manage characters, equipment, and spells. Like its predecessor, the soundtrack of Secret of Mana 2 was produced by Hiroki Kikuta. His distinct flavor of composition is noticeable once again, and he provided his own sound samples and performed all of the sound data encoding. One of the characteristics that stands out the most is his use of rhythm and melody on the same tracks. From the outset, the game hits you with Where Angels Fear to Tread, an emotional theme of sorts for the game. I think the songs in the sequel are a bit darker and more mature than Secret of Mana's score, but some fans might not like it quite as much. Each area of the world has its own musical flavors, and the title soundtrack of 60 songs made it one of the biggest on the system. Personally, I think this soundtrack is superior to the other games in the series, including Secret of Mana. RPG fans in North America that missed out on this game the first time it was released lucked out in 2020, 
when Square Enix remade the game completely. Released as Trials of Mana for the Nintendo Switch, Sony PlayStation 4, and Windows as a 3D remake of the original game, it retains most of the storyline, while providing an up-to-date experience. I haven't played this version of the game at all, but from all accounts, it was honorably done. Between the two though, I recommend the Super Famicom version, as that's the one that lured me in. As a fan of retro RPGs, the remake simply doesn't appeal to me as much. For younger gamers though, it very well may. If Secret of Mana 2 was actually released in North America in 1995, it would have absolutely gone down as one of the best RPGs on the system, and its name would be mentioned alongside titans like Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy VI, and Earthbound. Its active combat, class system, soundtrack, and incredible storyline were among its best aspects, and it's still fun to play today. I think it's superior to Secret of Mana in every single way, and it's a true shame that most gamers didn't get to discover it until many years later. It still stands in my mind as the best game in the Mana series, bar none. Hey man, you should check out the sequel to Secret of Mana. It's called Secret of Evermore. At least, that's what one of my friends told me back when this title came out. And even while I can look back now and see how someone may have believed that at the time, it's definitely not. While Secret of Evermore shamelessly uses several gameplay and user interface elements from Secret of Mana, the game is its own beast entirely. The title was unique in that it was the only Squaresoft game on the SNES that was fully created in-house in the company's studios in Washington, and it was never even released in Japan. So six and a half months after Chrono Trigger was released, us RPG freaks were able to play Secret of Evermore for the first time in October of 1995. And let's just say, the game has become one of Squaresoft's most polarizing games ever. And in this video, I'll explain why and give you a full overview of the game. But before I do so, please like this video and subscribe to my channel for more retro gaming and classic RPG content. Several things about Secret of Evermore are totally unique, but one of the most recognizable is the story. This one has you playing as an unnamed boy from Padunk, a normal town in the US. As he leaves a movie theater, his dog begins chasing a cat down the street and into a mysterious mansion. Inside, the two find a secret laboratory with a mechanical device. The hero's dog chews on the wires, which charges them both with electricity and sends them to Evermore. There, a shadowy figure named Carltron hurries the hero past a professor doing experiments and through a gate. After fighting off some enemies with a bazooka, the hero falls down a hole and into an escape hatch with his dog, and the two are launched on a ship, and they crash land into a prehistoric region. From there, the two set out to find their way back home and venture through various unique regions to do so. It's certainly a wacky premise that stands out from almost everything on the system, and it incorporates a heck of a lot of corniness. For instance, all throughout the game, the hero compares key storyline moments to various movies, and it's really cheesy. There is a lot of humorous dialogue and a few interesting non-player characters thrown in, but honestly there isn't much character development to speak of at all. You do eventually uncover more information about the mysterious figure and professor you ran into at the beginning, and learn about the origins of Evermore, though. Combat plays out almost exactly like Secret of Mana. It uses an action-oriented combat system where you have a charge meter at the bottom of the screen, and if you strike enemies before it's charged up, you'll do suboptimal damage. Just like that game too, there are a variety of weapons to gather as well, and you can level the weapons up as well as your dog skill. Each weapon and dog skill requires 256 experience points to advance to the next level, and the max level is 3. So once you obtain level 2 or 3, you can also charge your weapon up to do more powerful hits when a charged hit is used. Casting spells themselves is a lot like Secret of Mana as well, but the spell mechanics are actually a lot different. Secret of Evermore uses alchemy, where each spell requires a special formula obtained from alchemists that are scattered throughout the adventure. Instead of magic points, alchemy formulas require various parts and ingredients, like wax, clay, and limestone, all of which can be found throughout the world. 
Your dog actually even helps you find these ingredients through a distinct animation that has him sniffing around and wandering over to places where ingredients are. So when the dog does that and the hero searches the area, you'll find them. Alchemy formulas also increase in level upon repeated use. And I just have to say, I think Alchemy is Secret of Evermore's biggest bright spot. This was a fun system that combined item gathering with advancement to create an innovative magic system. I found that the discovery process of finding the most useful formulas and leveling them up to beat the game's challenges was really enjoyable. And speaking of the game's challenges, I thought the bosses were pretty well designed and some of them have pretty impressive graphics and animations. Probably the best is this one, which is called Thrax, which is just really freaking cool and it was used in the game's cover and for its marketing. But there's more where that came from too, and all of them were big encounters that pose a significant challenge and stand out even more than bosses in turn-based RPGs do. The game's music incorporates a few tunes with interesting melodies, but overall, it adopts much more of an ambient approach compared to Squaresoft's other games. This certainly makes it a bit unique, and some people have expressed that they love it for this reason. It was also composed by Jeremy Soule, who went on to produce all sorts of wildly popular video game soundtracks like Dungeon Siege, Baldur's Gate, and Elder Scrolls. It'll definitely be a change of pace to you if you're used to stuff by Nobuo Uematsu and Yasunori Mitsuda. Secret of Evermore definitely has its fair share of annoyances though, and I think there are two in particular. Number one is that there's a mandatory marketplace area in Nobilia where you have 15 minutes to exchange a series of different items to gain special equipment, but the game doesn't make clear what your goal is and you can't just skip this segment. So you just end up having to sit there and wander around if you don't know what's going on. Secondly, the hit detection in this game just flat out sucks. Sometimes you'll be striking right at enemies and no hit goes off, and that's so frustrating. Sometimes it almost seems random when it comes to whether a hit will land or not, and that's a pretty big issue. Secret of Evermore definitely got its fair share of marketing when it came out. Just check out this commercial. All things considered, I can see why Secret of Evermore is so polarizing. On the one hand, it incorporates some really solid gameplay mechanics, especially the weapon advancement and alchemy systems, with a pretty unique story and solid music. And it's also easy to play because a lot of people who've played Secret of Mana will be familiar with its ring interface system. But on the other hand, the hero has almost no character development, the hit detection is rough, and the crazy marketplace saga was just stupid. It's still a solid game, and I liked it a lot more than I hated it, but I just can't say it compares to the best RPGs the SNES had to offer. Following the success of Romancing Saga 2, Squaresoft released Romancing Saga 3, the sixth title in the saga series of role-playing games, in 1995. The game was a big hit in Japan and was considered one of the company's flagship titles on the Super Famicom. Even though it sold 1.3 million copies, the game never made its way to North America, which is a true shame. Thankfully, the game has since received a fan translation, making it possible for English-speaking players to experience the game today. The Saga series is famous for adopting an extremely non-linear style of gameplay, which emphasizes open-world exploration and a branching plot, where there is considerably more freedom than in games like Final Fantasy. Of course, Romancing Saga 3 is no exception. In addition, the character development system in the game is based on an idea utilized in Final Fantasy 2, where individual stats are increased when abilities or circumstances tied to those stats are used in battle. For instance, the character has a chance to receive an agility boost after using short swords and martial arts attacks. In the same way, strength has the chance of being boosted after using large swords, hand axes, or large axes. 
The story of Romancing Saga 3 is centered upon a cataclysmic event, the Death Eclipse, which appears on the Earth every 300 years. This event occurs when a star travels in front of the sun, blocking its light, and causing a ruinous eclipse that destroys all the life on the planet. About 600 years ago, one child miraculously lived through this catastrophe and became an all-powerful being called the Devil King. He ruled the world as a tyrant, opened up an abyss filled with devil lords, and released them onto the world. However, one day he mysteriously vanishes. After the death eclipse of 300 years ago, a single child survived yet again, but this time he did not become an evil lord. He instead became a legendary hero and a holy king. He vanquished the devil lords that remained and closed the entrance to the abyss. The death eclipse hit the world yet again about 10 years prior to the events of the game, while the whole world waits for the new child of destiny, and a lot of tension looms over whether he'll be a devil king or holy king. In Romancing Saga 3, the player is given the choice at the beginning of the game to select a main character out of eight choices. Each character is thrust into the center of a war between Godwin, the rebellious minister of the Kingdom of Loan, and Mikhail, the King of Loan. The game's story unfolds differently depending on the character you select, but it is also affected by the events that have already occurred, what is said in conversations, and who is present in the party. Even still, at a high level, the story is mostly the same overarching narrative. As one of the game's highlights, combat utilizes a turn-based combat system that will be familiar to most fans of the genre. Each character can execute and unlock a series of techniques. These techniques are divided by weapon type, giving each weapon a specific set of techniques. There is also magic in the game, but it isn't dependent on weapon type. Unlike some RPGs, the characters leap across the screen and execute unique animations for techniques and spells. Some of these attacks were just downright awesome, and it really was a cool facet of the game that wasn't done in many other RPGs at the time. Formations for combat are also a great touch, and the game is very customizable in this way. Different formations allow you to make strategic decisions to survive battles, and this is especially useful for the boss battles. Unfortunately, the stat-based progression system the game offers seems to be a bit arbitrary and frustrating. During the early parts of the game, stat progression is relatively steady, with skill-ups occurring consistently. However, by the end of the game, you reach a point where some stat increases reach a near standstill, which only encourages painful grinding. Also, weapon skill-ups require finding specific types of enemies, and using specific skills ad nauseum in the hopes that a skill-up will occur. Although this type of progression system is a hallmark of the Saga franchise, I can say that games like Romancing Saga 2 and Saga Frontier didn't seem nearly as tedious. Although the skill-up system has some faults, I think the game's technique system is a unique high point. In Romancing Saga 3, new techniques are learned through preconditions that make the character think of the technique during combat. New techniques can only be learned by using the new skill's parent technique enough times in battle to trigger the process. When this occurs, you see a little light bulb animation and perform the new technique for the first time. Using the new techniques enough times will allow the character to master it. There are some other odd quirks about the game, like the inability to have access to items in combat. Instead, items are only available from the menu screen, and there is very limited space for them. Also, unlike games like Final Fantasy, your party's hit points refill to full after battle, which is actually pretty convenient, it's just something to get used to. It's also possible to save almost anywhere in the world. The game's storyline really has some high and low points. Overall, I found the character development in Romancing Saga 3 to be lacking. I actually thought the premise for the game's overarching story was great and really unique. However, the same cannot be said when it comes to the characters, where the game kind of keeps you hanging. During the introduction sequences, the character development is actually quite strong, but these moments are seemingly abandoned after a certain point. Also, the party's eventual objective in the game is to beat the four bosses of the Abyss, but I don't think the game does a very good job of explaining why. If you're expecting the game's story to be something like Final Fantasy VI, you'll be disappointed. That's not to say that what is there is particularly bad, though. It's just not as riveting as some of its counterparts. The music of Romancing Saga 3 was composed by Kenji Ito, who had also composed the previous two games in the Saga series, Romancing Saga and Romancing Saga 2. 
There are 68 tracks comprising an immense variety of themes and moods to fit the game's story. Out of all the soundtracks Ido has done that I have listened to, I think this one's actually the best. And honestly, the music is probably the best aspect of Romancing Saga 3. A few of my favorite songs include the opening theme, boss battle, Mikhail's theme, and Demon King Palace. The graphics in Romancing Saga 3 are about at the level one would expect from a game of its time, and look pretty reminiscent of Final Fantasy VI. In battle, the sprite attack animations are much more advanced when compared to many of the games of the era though, as are the spell effects. The backgrounds won't blow you away or anything, but the colors are vibrant, and there's lots of differing environments the game offers. No matter how you slice it, North American RPG fans certainly missed out on this game, and it is more than worth it to revisit it today. However, the SNES translation that is widely available unfortunately leaves much to be desired, as there's some awkward grammar and sentence structure there. It may please some fans to know that after the success of the Romancing Saga 2 remake on Steam and mobile phones, Square Enix has decided to bring Romancing Saga 3 into the new generation as well, on PlayStation Vita and mobile platforms. By 1996, Squaresoft had released several critically acclaimed RPGs on the Super Famicom. After 1995's Chrono Trigger, however, the gaming industry started shifting to next-generation consoles. The Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation were popular in both Japan and North America, and game developers began focusing on those platforms. Even so, Squaresoft pushed on and released three additional RPGs on the Super Famicom in 1996. One of them was Bahamut Lagoon, which arrived in Japan in February of that year. Bahamut Lagoon is a turn-based, fantasy-oriented strategy RPG. It's grid-oriented, and terrain and spacing play a big role in battles. Unlike the two other RPGs Squaresoft published in 1996, Bahamut Lagoon's development team featured some key staff members of the Final Fantasy team. They included director Kazushiga Nojime, writer Motomu Toriyama, and series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi working as a supervisor. Their influence is certainly felt here, because even though not a Final Fantasy game, there are some similarities that can be found within it. For instance, some sprites used within the game are nearly identical to those that can be found in Final Fantasy VI. Even so, rather than a Final Fantasy spin-off, it's more accurate to consider Bahamut Lagoon as a standalone game. The title takes its name from Bahamut, the King of Dragons from the Final Fantasy games. There doesn't seem to be much of a lore crossover between the two though, so it's best understood that the Final Fantasy Dragon and the Bahamut Lagoon Dragon are separate entities. The term Lagoon does have important meaning. The world of Aurelis is composed of several continents that float in the sky. These continents are called Lagoons, which play into the game's story. Bahamut Lagoon features an epic tale that kicks off just as the Grand Balos Empire launches an invasion of Kana Kingdom. As the captain of the kingdom's dragon squad, Bu is sent to repel the invasion. After making small inroads, the kingdom is completely overrun, leaving Bu to sort things out with the help of allies. Like the main character in Chrono Trigger, Bu is a silent protagonist, and his decisions and dialogue are guided by the player. The allied characters are well developed, and the game did a pretty good job of throwing in a few interesting twists and turns along the way. In fact, the ending was dark and quite bittersweet. Of course, I won't spoil it. The combat in Bahamut Lagoon is grid-based, and very similar to games like Tactics Ogre, Dare Langrisser, and Final Fantasy Tactics. Certain spells can affect multiple groups of units, while some can only affect a single one. The interface for movement and map strategy was well designed, and easy enough to use. Some of the structures on the map can be affected by spells. For instance, certain spells can be used against walls to clear the way for ground forces to move through. This system allowed for some creativity to be employed by the player, something lacking in many other strategy RPGs. The most unique aspect of Bahamut Lagoon revolves around dragons. Each party of four characters has a dragon assigned to it, and each dragon has its own stats and combat abilities. Unlike allied characters in a party, Dragons are totally uncontrollable in combat, and are guided only by artificial intelligence. If dragons die in combat, the bond that they share with the characters they're grouped with are adversely affected as well. All dragons are unique, and it was a really nice touch to add powerful dragons as elements to take account for in combat. The game requires quite a bit of micromanagement, which is kind of a double-edged sword. 
Creating optimal parties of four characters, equipping them, creating the right formations, and placing dragons correctly takes a lot of time. Some players may enjoy this, while others may consider it a chore. It's similar to the original Ogre Battle game in that way. In battle, the attack animations of both the friendly and enemy characters are very impressive, and people that follow this channel know I'm a sucker for detailed animations. When characters unleash their attacks, it looks really special. Even things as mundane as enemies slashing you really adds a lot to the experience and draws the player in. It's equally remarkable how many unique attacks were created in this one. Unfortunately, the dragons lack the striking animations that the enemies and allies have, but overall, the combat visuals are fantastic. Bahamut Lagoon remained unplayable to the vast majority of North American gamers until 2002, when DJAP Translations released a fully English localized version. This is the one I played for hours when it was released, and I can't express how excited I was to be able to play it. It really was a treat to get my hands on anything new that was Squaresoft related in those days. In addition to the 2002 English patch, yet another group called Nier released its own English translation in 2020, so there's multiple ways to play this game in English now. I don't have many specifics on differences that exist between these two translations, but if you do, let me know in the comments. I'll include links to both translations in the description below, so you can get your hands on them. As far as soundtracks go, this game offers a score of epic tunes that you would expect from a fantasy-oriented RPG. The opening theme's especially catchy and always stuck with me. There's a total of 36 tracks, which was around average for an RPG of this era. Of the three RPGs released by Squaresoft in 1996, I think this one had the best soundtrack. Outside of Nobuo Uematsu and Yasunori Mitsuda's work, I think this one stands as one of the best RPG soundtracks on the entire Super Famicom. It's really just that good. Bahamut Lagoon sold relatively well in Japan for the time it was released. About 475,000 copies were purchased in 1996, making it the 17th best-selling game of that year. That's no small feat either for a year that included the release of many popular next-generation titles and the launch of the Nintendo 64. Bahamut Lagoon was a fun strategy RPG with good visuals and sound. It delivers more fun through gameplay than it does storyline, but it really isn't deficient in either category. I think it's well worth playing today if you couldn't play it back in the day due to the language barriers. Overall, I really liked the game and was so glad when I learned it was first translated way back then. While Squaresoft could have just made a cookie cutter RPG exactly like Final Fantasy, they used some creative concepts here and made it stand out from their flagship series. As far as RPGs go, Bahamut Lagoon is the very definition of a hidden gem. As most of my viewers know, my focus and forte is retro console RPGs. I absolutely love them, but I still don't limit my retro gaming to them alone. I also like other game types, including run-and-gun shooters like Metal Slug, Contra, and others. The two genres don't seem to provide much of a crossover, but wouldn't it have been great if they could have been combined somehow? Well, Omiyasoft and Squaresoft did just that on the Super Famicom, and the result of this dream was Front Mission Gun Hazard. It was an unprecedented fusion of a run-and-gun shooter and an RPG, and likely one of the most unique hybrid games on the system. The title was released in early 1996, so it was a bit overlooked given the Super Famicom was beyond its prime as a new generation of consoles took over. First of all, Front Mission Gun Hazard shouldn't be confused with the first Front Mission game, which came out on the Super Famicom in 1995. That game marked Squaresoft's first true foray into the world of tactical RPGs, but it's very much unlike Front Mission Gun Hazard. The cool thing is though, is that the futuristic world of that game and its themes were directly brought into this one. Even though it's a guidance of sorts that doesn't follow the exact timeline, many of the same concepts are used. In this way, it's best described as a spin-off within the same world. It's a side-scrolling game where you don cybernetic armor, complete missions, and advance in power to tackle new challenges. The game was developed by much of the same team that created Cybernator, and I have to tell you, the influence is significant. When I first saw this game, I actually confused the two games. Front Mission Gun Hazard is nothing if not story-centric, and relies heavily on the history leading up to the start of the game. 
In the early 21st century, the many nations of the world feuded over power and natural resources. However, the various nations of the world banded together in cooperation to create an orbital elevator known as Atlas in 2024. The device intended to provide power to the world, but its development was abandoned in favor of fusion reactors. Atlas thus became a symbol of failed dreams and hopes as the world regressed back into sectional conflicts between nations. The year is now 2064, and Colonel Ark Helbrand stages a coup to overthrow the Republic of Bergen, led by President Moss Orwin. In his attempt to stop the coup, he taps NORAD, a paramilitary defense force, to assist. Among those involved is Albert Grabner, the game's main protagonist and soldier in NORAD's Norwegian branch. He and his mentor Leros are sent to confront the rogue colonel. The story takes off from there, and I'll just say it has some really dark moments that provides a pretty big contrast to some of the other RPGs Squaresoft has published. Like many of the Japanese-only releases I cover, this one has a full English translation that was released in 2004 by the great folks at Aeon Genesis. Just trust me, it's one of the best, if not the best, translation teams out there, so it's definitely worth checking out. If you saw this project in English without knowing its origin, you would have thought it was a professional effort, to be sure. As usual, I'll provide a link to the translation patch in the description. One of the most fun things about Front Mission Gun Hazard is its power progression system. Just like any other RPG, you level up from experience gained from destroying enemies. Gaining higher levels also grants you access to progressively more powerful weapons and armor. Beyond this, actually using weapons and missions upgrades their efficiency over time in a percentage-based system. This means that weapons will eventually reload quicker, hit harder, or create a larger spread. Beyond the base weaponry, you can also customize your mech with a variety of weapons and equipment, all of which requires funds acquired during missions. Like you might imagine, many of the weapons have various strengths and weaknesses, and you're limited in power by being forced to choose among them. Both long and short range attacks can be acquired and used, and there's also some really strong single use items that really come in handy during boss encounters. The primary weapon is the most important though. You can also shoot in eight directions, including diagonals. Another great thing is that in addition to the main protagonist, you gain mech piloting allies throughout your journey that assist you in missions. The allies can really help you get past some of the game's challenges, but sometimes the AI that controls them isn't too hot. And then there's the block, probably the most defining aspect of Front Mission Gun Hazard, the thing that sets it apart from so many other games. Your block ability can stop various projectiles from doing damage to you. It can also be used to set up return volleys. This facet made the game one where you have to think on the fly and adapt to what's going on around you rather than simply just button mashing. Getting better at blocks really gives you the same level of power increase as weapons, armor, and upgrades do. You can also leave the mech to explore as your human character, and this is necessary to complete some parts of the game. It's pretty annoying since you're almost powerless without your uber powerful armor, but most of the time you don't have to be on foot for very long. An even more annoying part of the combat mech gameplay is that your own mech gets damaged whenever it's in range of enemy explosions, so it's a good idea to destroy things from a long range if you can. I really have to add that the sprite animations in Front Mission Gun Hazard are among the very best on the system, bar none. The numerous frames used for each movement are just awesome, and really add a lot to the experience. There's also a great use of texture, and how the game's platforms tend to blend into the backgrounds. All the explosions, and even environmental effects like the sunset that brightens and dims as it becomes obscured by the landscape, is just fantastic for the era. The graphics are really sophisticated, and a lot of work was obviously poured in to make it a great game to look at. Comparing this title to earlier action titles on the SNES, like ActRaiser for instance, makes this fact very clear. The soundtrack of Front Mission Gun Hazard was created by the legendary Nobuo Uematsu and Yasunori Mitsuda, so by that fact alone, you already know it's amazing. It's definitely a different feel than a lot of their other work though, so don't be surprised if you're taken aback a bit by the style. It uses a lot of synthesized and ambient sounds to match the futuristic motif, 
but you can still discern both of their musical geniuses in the work. As a whole, it sounds almost nothing like Chrono Trigger, but it's really good in its own right too. You can tell that both musicians were going for something different, and I think it was pretty successful. Front Mission Gun Hazard got a relatively sour response from gaming publications at the time, like Famitsu, which gave it a 28 out of 40. Still, that didn't stop it from selling. 300,000 total copies were sold in Japan, which was a pretty big accomplishment for a game released that late in Super Famicom history. Unfortunately, this game has never been localized officially in the West, but you can pick up a fairly cheap cartridge on eBay if you're a collector. Hopefully at some point it'll be brought to Steam, like the Romancing Saga games and Live Alive. It is a bit short compared to many of its conventional RPG counterparts though, it can be beaten in about 15 to 20 hours. Even still, this game has it all. Great graphics and animations, fun gameplay that'll keep your eyes glued to the screen, a solid story that dives deep into morality and philosophy, and a cool soundtrack. It's definitely one of the most innovative games on the system and earns bonus points for daring to be different. It's super overlooked and there's really nothing else on the system like it. Even with hindsight, the merger of the Mario and Final Fantasy franchises seemed like an impossibility. In the mid-1990s, the two worlds offered something distinct for two very separate groups of fans. Those that loved Super Mario expected lighthearted action, coin collecting, block breaking, pipes to enter, familiar adversaries, and firepower. Fans of the Final Fantasy games, on the other hand, expected an epic, dark story filled with twists and turns, a lovable cast of characters that the player could empathize with, and distinct adventure with some familiar tropes. While legendary Nintendo game designer Shigeru Miyamoto created the world of Mario, the Final Fantasy series was the masterwork of the renowned Hironobu Sakaguchi of Squaresoft. It struck many as a surprise then, when the two video game masterminds combined their efforts into Super Mario RPG, Legend of the Seven Stars for the SNES. Story-wise, the game throws you for a loop right away. Given that this is a Super Mario game, almost everyone would expect Bowser to be the primary adversary. And indeed, the game seems to point you in this direction from the get-go. As the story starts, Princess Toadstool is minding her own business among flowers and butterflies, but Bowser takes notice and swoops down to kidnap her. But after Mario runs to Bowser's keep to rescue her, the player soon finds that the game will be of a different type entirely. Princess Toadstool's rescue is interrupted by the arrival of a giant sword, which falls from the sky and lodges itself in Bowser's keep. In the process, Bowser and the princess are flung to other parts of the world, and Mario is cut off from the castle. The giant sword tells him it's now under the control of the Smithy Gang, and he's left with more questions than answers. Those that designed the game's story, I think, should be commended for originality at the very least. Even though the game uses so many familiar characters from the Mario universe, like Toad, Yoshi, Lakitu, and others, I was impressed by the way that the overall story was handled. Rather than just replicating the same story fans were accustomed to, a new one was created entirely. In this way, the game was a bit more like Final Fantasy than Mario. Though most of the playable characters will be familiar to Mario fans, there were two new additions. Malo is a cloud-like being that believes he is a tadpole, and cries whenever he's upset, producing rain throughout the world. Gino is the incarnation of a star that has come from above to help repair the Star Road, which has been destroyed by Smithy and his minions. He uses a variety of star-powered weapons, including various guns and cannons. Of the two, he is my definite favorite. Gaining both Bowser and Princess Toadstool as playable characters was also a novel concept. Bowser uses spike balls and claws to deal damage, while Peach favors the frying pan. Now if that isn't a great choice of weaponry, I don't know what is. Out of all the qualities of Super Mario RPG, the active battle system has to be one of the areas that stands out the most. The combat offered something almost no other RPG of its era did, timed attacks. For all basic attacks, the player can use the action button a second time during the execution of the attack. If timed correctly, the animation will be expanded and the attack will do additional damage to the enemy. This can also be used to guard the player from enemy attacks where a well-timed press of the button can lead to considerably less damage. There are also some special attacks that use a timing system as well, such as the Geno Beam. Finding the correct timing for each attack was a fun way to add replay value, and more importantly, keep the player engaged throughout. 
Outside of the timed attack system, damage and healing items can be used by characters through a shared inventory, and each character has an independent array of special abilities they gain as they level, not unlike Chrono Trigger. Even though fans of Final Fantasy would not be expecting such action-oriented gameplay in turn-based battles, virtually the entire basis of Mario games was action-oriented gameplay. So this was a great way to blend the two experiences together into a system that both groups of fans could enjoy. One of the clear highlights of Super Mario RPG is the copious amount of humor that's used throughout the game. Rather than incorporate a dark, foreboding world that many RPG enthusiasts would have been familiar with, the game designers made a conscious effort to lighten the story with comedic moments. One of the humorous refrains that's used several times is the idea that Bowser is bitter that his keep's been taken from him, and is often too embarrassed to admit it. Throughout the story, he's mortified to reveal this fact because it will ruin his reputation. When he joins the party, he also lies and says he's making Mario and his friends part of the Koopa Troop to save face for his cause. Another unexpected comedic moment happens when Mario retrieves one of the seven stars from a sunken ship. The ship belongs to a group of pirates, led by their leader Johnny Jones. Though Johnny and his henchmen put up a fight, the chief adheres to a rigid code of honor believing that Mario earned the star. He even goes so far as to help Mario when one of Smithy's lackeys, Yuridovich, attempts to steal it. These humorous moments really aren't unique either. Like Earthbound, the game is filled with them, and they play a big role in the player's enjoyment. There's just all sorts of ridiculous stuff. For example, when an oddball named Booster attempts to marry Princess Toadstool, the wedding is foiled by Mario, enraging the chefs that created the wedding cake. If that wasn't enough, the villainous Boshi steals all the cookies from the Yoshis on Yoster Isle, so the cookie thief must be stopped so that they can all race again. There's even a cheesy heart-to-heart -heart moment between Frogfucius and Malo, when Malo discovers he's not a tadpole after all. It's just so hyperbolic and silly, and still makes me laugh today. There's so many of these moments that I don't have nearly enough time to cover them all. You just have to play the game to see them for yourself. I can see how some zealous RPG fans could have been turned off by this humorous approach, but those that love the game often point to it as a memorable facet. Many of the hardcore RPG fanatics I know, including myself, were willing to put aside their typical expectations because the game fits perfectly into its own mold. The musical soundtrack of Super Mario RPG is also quite memorable, and many of the songs fit the game's various locations perfectly. While there are a few remixes from previous Mario games, most of the compositions in this one are completely unique. One of my favorites was the theme in the forest near Rosetown, where Mario goes searching for Geno. The mysterious forest melody perfectly harmonized with the objective in the game at the time, which involved finding one's way through a wooded labyrinth. The song for Nimbus Land, the true home of Malo, also has an extremely infectious theme that will echo through your head. The soundtrack is just awesome overall. The visuals in Super Mario RPG are also striking. While I'll continue to maintain that graphical quality in an RPG is much less important than other elements, the game's graphics are marvelous and probably some of the best on the system. The colors in the game are extremely vibrant, and the animations that occur in battle are equally impressive. You can certainly tell that the developers put in a lot of time and effort to make individual attacks unique, even ones belonging to enemy characters that only appear once. I suppose this is to be expected from a 32 megabyte cart, but in some ways, I think the graphics look better in this one than some of the larger carts on the system. Even the visuals of my beloved Star Ocean, which was on a 48 megabyte cart, looked less impressive than those in this one. The game made use of an isometric view to create a semi-3D look and feel, and this system was ingeniously used so that Mario's jumping ability can be put to the test throughout the game. Treasure boxes, some of which are hidden, are found throughout the adventure, and it's necessary to jump onto platforms and circumnavigate areas of differing elevations throughout the areas and dungeons. There were also a lot of great side quests in the game, including ones that allow Mario to obtain access to extremely powerful items and accessories. The one that stands out the most by far was the inclusion of a Final Fantasy-styled adversary called Kulex. When you retrieve a shiny stone, you can bring it into Monstro Town to open a magically sealed door. Inside, Kulex challenges Mario and his friends from another dimension. In the run-up, the classic Final Fantasy Crystal theme plays, and the song that plays during the fight is the same as the boss battle theme from Final Fantasy IV. Kulex is by far the most challenging enemy in the game, and his design was awesome. He also commands four powerful elemental crystals, 
which fit into the Final Fantasy motif perfectly. By receiving the Quartz Charm, an incredibly powerful accessory, the player is also rewarded nicely for beating the Mega Boss. Despite the accolades, I don't think Super Mario RPG is absolutely perfect. I think it does suffer a bit for being quite short. The game can definitely be completed in about 12 to 15 hours by a first time player, and most of the bosses are on the easy side. This made the journey a player takes through the game a little bit less momentous than one would experience from some other RPGs such as Final Fantasy VI or Chrono Trigger. Even still, the content that is packed into the title is substantial. The other gripe I have, albeit more minor, is that the game is very linear. I think the world map could have been executed a bit better, but typically new paths are opened and the destination is always obvious. North American fans of the SNES certainly consider this game one of the greatest RPGs, if not games, for the system. For this reason, it was wisely included on Nintendo's SNES Classic. Considering that complete copies of the game fetch a steep price, this method is a great option to play the game. You can also get it much cheaper on the Wii U through the link in the description. Super Mario RPG was released in mid-1996, at the very end of the life of the SNES in North America. To put this in context, the N64 and Super Mario 64 were to be released just one month afterward. This probably limited some of its successes, but make no mistake, this title is still given great reverence by fans today. It's just so unfortunate that the game never got the true sequel fans deserved. Nintendo did incorporate some of the concepts from Super Mario RPG into the Paper Mario series, but those games don't provide the same experience. All in all, I consider Super Mario RPG an incredibly enjoyable game. I can't say I like it quite as much as some of the darker, more epic RPGs of the era, but it is a standout title that blended various types of gameplay effectively for the audience it was intended to satisfy. It's also a perfect RPG for beginners that haven't played many games of its kind. By the end of the Super Famicom's life cycle, Squaresoft had established itself as the predominant master of the RPG genre. From the Final Fantasy games, to Chrono Trigger, to Super Mario RPG, the company had pretty much done it all on the system. However, as 1996 rolled around, most developers halted their efforts to begin planning to produce games for the next generation consoles. Instead, Squaresoft published a series of games in 1996, one of which was Rudra no Hiho, or Treasure of the Rudras. It was the very last game the company developed in-house for the Super Famicom. Since the game was only released in Japan, one may ask how it can be played in English. Well, thanks to the amazing efforts of Aeon Genesis, the game was fully translated in 2003 for the first time. A blessing to all the RPG fanatics that missed out on this gem back then. Like all Aeon Genesis translations, rigorous work was put into this project, and the dialogue was brilliantly crafted. I can't say enough about how enjoyable this translation was. It was a really professional endeavor that put some licensed translations <coughs> Breath of Fire 2 <coughs> to shame. As far as storyline goes, Treasure of the Rudras is purely innovative. Its setting is a futuristic world that's been ravaged by pollution. In its current condition, Mankind will be destroyed in 15 days, and many have already lost hope that the world's demise can be reversed. Most of the game centers upon the drive of the characters to do so, though. What makes this interesting is the various characters have different ideas in regard to how to accomplish that, so seeing how the contradictory perspectives played out was awesome. The game's intro is also pretty dark, and was illustrated with the best cinematography the Super Famicom could offer. The story is divided into three main scenarios, each of which features a main protagonist. Sion is a soldier that was trained by a well-known swordsman and seeks to be the strongest man in the world. Riza is a princess that seeks to purify the world and reverse the environmental calamity that threatens it. Finally, Serlent is an archaeologist that seeks to gain knowledge of the world's destruction. Each of the three scenarios can be played in any order, and you can even depart from one scenario before completing it to play another. Incredibly, the actions that the characters take in one scenario can even affect the circumstances of the others when you return to them. For instance, specific locations can be visited at different seasons for different results, and items left behind in one scenario will be there for characters in the others to discover. In terms of RPG innovations, this element was distinct, and virtually no other game I can think of did anything like this. 
As I played through the game, I couldn't help but be awestruck by how interconnected this made the world feel. Also, the three separate groups of characters crossed paths at various points through the storyline, and it was incredibly fun to see how they interacted. You also witnessed some of the same crucial storyline elements from completely different perspectives, which was also a great touch. This factor has led some reviewers to note that the story plays out similarly to Game of Thrones, where the aims of the characters, no matter how evil, are justified by context. After completing the original three scenarios, a fourth scenario is revealed to play. It features the roving thief Dune in tandem with the other three heroes. There's some real surprises at the end, so I won't spoil it here. The structure of the scenarios reminded me a bit of Squaresoft's Live Alive, another Japan-only release, but that game's scenarios were much more distinct from one another and didn't have the crossover overlap that Treasure of the Rudras does. This system is very unique, and it works well for this game. The most standout aspect of Treasure of the Rudras in comparison to other RPGs of the time is definitely the spell system. In most games of this kind, of course, you obtain spells organically by gaining levels or buying them. In this one, however, spells, known in this game as mantra, are created by adding prefixes and suffixes to root words. Some of the root words are learned after dialogue with characters and NPCs, while others are found in chess. Most of the magic root words represent a basic archetype. For instance, lef, L-E-F, is a basic heal. When you combine it with the suffix na, N-A, for left na, the heal affects multiple allies for the price of four additional magic points. There are all sorts of combinations like this, and a lot of the game's fun is found in discovering the best for each situation. Combat in Treasure of the Rudras is turn-based, not unlike what you'd find in the world of Final Fantasy. The way the characters are oriented on the screen is also really reminiscent of the romancing saga games. The sprite-based 2D graphics in Treasure of the Rudras are among the best the SNES has to offer. Visually, the game is as much of a treat to look at as Chrono Trigger is, and offers even better character animations in battle. Each character has several unique animations that stand out, which was a characteristic that seemed to transcend the era. At that time, almost every other game on the system had simplistic animations, usually with characters limited to a few each. Also, the layered backgrounds made even simple things, like wandering around in the world, look like a spectacle that postdated the SNES. The graphical work was really pre-3D Squaresoft at its best. So, what in the world is a Rudra? As the story goes, the Rudra are a godlike race that appear on the planet every 4,000 years, immediately before a cataclysmic event. The Rudra destroy it, recreate the world in a new image, and eventually turn into fossilized remains. This element borrows heavily from Indian culture, namely the concept of the Wheel of Time. The clues the Rudra left behind, and the character's pursuit of them, was a fun concept. As a motif, it completely disposed of the whole Confront the Empire theme that most RPGs of this time adopted. As far as soundtracks go, Treasure the Rudras brings a respectable variety of fantasy-oriented tunes. It's almost impossible to approach the quality of a soundtrack composed by, say, Nobuo Uematsu or Yasunori Mitsuda, but this one comes close. It was done by Ryuji Sasai, who also did the music for Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. It's a treat to listen to, and if you're familiar with RPG-style music, the score will be right up your alley. There's also certain important themes that have day and night versions, which was also a unique little twist. Overall, Treasure of the Rudras was a great RPG that North American gamers simply missed out on. If it had been released here, it may well have gained the same acclaim and cult following as the other Squaresoft titans of the era. The timing couldn't have been worse for its retail release on a system that was dying, but thankfully, those who still love the RPGs from that time can play it again now and still have a lot of fun with it. With its creative magic system and overlapping storyline as its most creative assets, it carries my highest recommendations. If you have played the renowned RPGs on the SNES, but not this one, I think you will find a lot of surprising similarities. The game is of high quality and certainly shouldn't be ignored by retro RPG freaks. Many Japan-only Super Famicom titles never made their way to North America because of a variety of reasons. For most games of this kind, it came down to cultural differences between audiences, regional genre preferences, and gargantuan scripts that required immense time and effort. With Treasure Hunter G, though, it seems more likely that the title never made its way across the sea because it was released so late in the system's life cycle. 
being released in May of 1996 meant that the next generation of consoles were already on their way, and few games were published on the SNES after that point. Regardless of its timing though, Treasure Hunter G was a fantastic RPG that checked many of the boxes when it came to desired qualities for a game of its kind. Thankfully, the game is now accessible to English-speaking audiences by way of a translation patch that was first released in 2002. Treasure Hunter G takes place in a fantasy world where two brothers, Red and Blue, travel the world. Their father, Brown G, is often away on grandiose treasure hunting expeditions, forcing both brothers to feel empty and neglected. Red is something of a macho personality, whereas his brother Blue lacks self-confidence and suffers from depression. Along their journey, they also find Rain, a quiet girl with a mysterious past. Accompanying her is Ponga, a monkey with an attitude. Along the way, the adventurers have to deal with a creatively named Dark Lord and his minions. The characters each have their own defining aspects that set them apart from the rest. Red is the most physical intensive fighter with high attack and defense. Blue is another good melee fighter that can make use of a teleportation ability. Rain is the party's main healer, and she gets some offensive magic as well. Ponga functions much like a wizard, and he can learn all the attack magic in the game. Combat in Treasure Hunter G takes place on a grid. Each cell on the battlefield is a shaded color, each of which uniquely impacts the circumstances of combat. For instance, yellow squares make your special abilities require twice as many resources to execute as blue squares do, whereas red squares require twice as many resources as the yellow squares. In other words, positioning has a huge impact on resource management, and where the characters are standing is extremely important. This requires strategic decisions to be made by the player, but I think the game actually does a pretty good job of making sure it isn't too unfair. This is because many of the items expand your resource points, otherwise known as ACT. Also, each of the characters possess a range of attacks, and those that are long range can allow them to avoid having to stand on the costly squares. Unlike many other titles of this type, your own party members can actually inflict damage upon the others, so you really have to keep this in mind as you play. In Treasure Hunter G, you gain experience points after every successful hit in combat, and characters level up each time they accumulate 100 points. Many of the battle mechanics are reminiscent of some of the strategy RPGs from this time. Expect combat to be much more similar to Vandal Hearts and Tactics Ogre than to Final Fantasy. When you play Treasure Hunter G, you'll immediately take notice of the amazing visuals. If you were to compare this game to some of the early RPGs on the system, like say Draken or the Seventh Saga, you will simply be blown away. Distinctly, the characters in Treasure Hunter G were built from 3D models instead of being drawn by hand. This decision made the characters look very different than any other RPG on the system, and it's really quite noticeable. The visuals in this one remind me a lot of the graphics you would find in Donkey Kong Country, and they definitely seem a bit ahead of their time. The game also features several incredible cutscenes that really develop the story. Some of these moments are actually incredible and really push the SNES to its limits. In some ways, Treasure Hunter G goes beyond even what Far East of Eden Zero did at times. It's almost like a prototype of full motion video, and you just have to see it to understand what I mean. The overworld map is also gorgeous, and probably the best looking one of any RPG on the system. I've never been one to think that graphics should be the most defining aspect of any RPG, but those in this game transcend almost every other game of its type on the system, and there's something to be said for that. The score in Treasure Hunter G was created by seven different composers. This was yet another unique facet of the game, as most titles from this time only had one or two people devoted to such a task. Overall, I like the soundtrack quite a bit. It isn't as strong or as infectious as Chrono Trigger or even Live Alive, but I thought it was pretty solid for a game not developed by Squaresoft. The songs feature a lot of simulated brass and harp instruments, and trumpets are heard in most of the tunes. This fact alone sets it apart from many other games. The actual technical quality of the songs might be the best on the entire system, but the tunes aren't as memorable. Regardless, with over 70 tracks, the soundtrack is huge, and there's lots of variety here. While Treasure Hunter G was published by Square, it was actually the first game made by a much smaller developer called Sting. When I first read this fact, I couldn't believe it, because for a first time developer, this game actually seems like a work of art. It just seems tremendously polished, even compared to games developed by companies with years of history under their belts. It was the last Squaresoft title published on the Super Famicom, and very shortly before the RPG Titan declared that they would be working with Sony on their upcoming titles, rather than Nintendo. 
As such, the game represents the end of an incredible RPG era. If it had been released here, I think Treasure Hunter G would have been considered one of the top RPGs on the system. Standing on its own merits, it's a darn good game. I don't think it has quite the epic story you would find in games like Final Fantasy VI or Chrono Trigger, but it's still an upper echelon RPG on the system. On a casual playthrough, Treasure Hunter G will give you about 20 hours of fun. The combat was so creative and well designed, and the gameplay is the title's best feature, but the amazing graphics also stand out as well. RPG fans that love strategy elements will like this one more than those that don't. And there it is, all 19 Squaresoft games on the SNES. Say what you want about these games, but it can never be denied that this was a golden age of the company and RPG games in general. But that being said, I want to hear from you. Which Squaresoft game on the SNES do you think was the best and why? Let me know in the comments below. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell for more retro gaming content. I'd also like to give a shout out to my Patreon patrons and YouTube members. If you want early access to the videos I produce and other perks like they receive, please consider supporting the channel by becoming a Patreon patron or via the YouTube join feature.